coming up this week off screen. We're off to La La Land. Casey Affleck visits Manchester by the sea. Kate Beckinsale arms up for the Blood Wars. Ben Affleck lives by night. There's laughs with young offenders. And it's all about the ultimate champion in the hurt business. All of us to come and more off screen. This is this is off screen. Off screen. <laughs> the latest film news and reviews. This is Offscreen, the on-screen radio show. Ooh, welcome to Offscreen, I'm Van Connor. I am Case Allen. It's 2017, Case, can you believe mm. it? Uh, well, you know, not for much longer. Not for much longer. For much we, longer. we have just watched the news conference, the, the press conference, because uh, obviously we're recording this on, on Wednesday. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've we've got at least one more show in us, and then... We're all going to die, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's yeah. go to that bunker. We've let's been go to that bunker, exactly. Yeah. So, we've got uh, six films this week. Okay, wow. six Challenge. new releases out. Challenge. One of those is is a direct to DVD video on demand release documentary. Uh, we're going to fit that in as well, and then we're going to use our podcast extra segment to do the KGs and our in memoriam and our worst films of the year list because we couldn't do that before. So exactly, we just kind of ran out of time, didn't we? The <laughs> exactly. year just sort of the stopped. year got away. From it just us. stopped. So shall we? Uh, have you any film news? To take us to the top ten. Yeah, I've got some huge news. So give, is, give me some huge this news. This is the biggest news of the week. Like Go on. bigger than Golden Globes, which we will obviously get to later on. Just of course, massive huge news. Okay, and Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage. That's always good. That's always huge. That's how I'm going to begin my year yeah. with Nicholas Cage. That's as, how you as, should, as usual. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Has been offered the lead role in a film about President Ronald Reagan. Oh man. <laughs> I and this. <laughs> I mean, has has he ever turned down a role? So chances are, if he's been offered it, this he, is filming heard, right now. I yeah. heard he was he was mulling over whether or not it would uh, damage his reputation, whether it would damage his career. And you just sort of think, <laughs> wow, no, no. Some of the things you've done, uh, yeah, yeah, I think you're okay, Nick. Unless you're going to be doing okay. like Bangkok Dangerous Two, <laughs> more, even more dangerous. This is a safer <laughs> bet than Bangkok Dangerous Two. Absolutely. Yeah. This is a safer bet than doing that Left Behind sequel. Unless this is like Ronald Reagan well, on the plane. There are oh, more books yeah. in the oh, Left oh, Behind man. If he have, have like a Left Behind, but like base it on... He's, he's like stuck in Air Force One or something. That, that you, yeah, that's all you. Because yeah. he could just fly another plane. Did he die? We don't know. Did he die in Left Behind? Um, I, I wasn't I paying attention oh, it was at that terrible. point. It really was. Even by it? Cage's uh, superior standards. Yeah. On yeah. which note, let's crack on with the top ten. Number ten. Ballerina. Not seen it. Couldn't possibly comment on it. Number nine. Monster Trucks, which everyone hated, except for you. Now, who hated it? I, I, I talked to critics the other day about it. We were, we were all kind of on the same page. I feel like they were all placating you, and no. then they talk behind your back. Okay, Chris Honeyset has a, a, an age-appropriate child for this film, and even he agreed his kid would love it. Yeah. And, you know, I okay. think if, if I was a seven-year-old boy, this would be the greatest film in the world. And think about it, they really don't make films that cater what, to... What films did you like as a seven-year-old boy? As a seven-year-old boy, I was a big Home Keep Alone fan. Oh, that's fair enough. Big Home Alone fan. Oh my god, everything just comes back to Trump, doesn't it? Let's move on. (laughs) Number eight. Rather appropriately, why him? (laughs) (laughs) Which is, uh, I almost said James McAvoy. James Franco. James James McAvoy. McAvoy. Next week. Yeah, James Franco. uh, uh, You know, James McAvoy in Why Him would be hilarious. Uh, James (laughs) Franco, though, is still hilarious. And Brian Cranston plays the straight man really, really well opposite him. They've got great chemistry. There's a lot of laughs in there. You've got the requisite let's drag up an 80s, 70s, 80s rock band for nostalgia purposes. In this, well, I'm not even going to say who it is in this case. Yeah. Um, and you've got Keegan Michael Key in there, and Megan yeah. Mullally, and there's a hell of a supporting comedic cast. And Adam Devine turns up, and Casey Wilson, and that guy from Girls, who I can never remember the name of. Uh, give me some more clues. Plays Elijah in Girls. Oh, uh, Andrew Rannells. Okay, there Andrew you go. Rannells. See, I don't know these things. Number seven. Uh, fantastical beasties, and where you're gonna locate them? Where, where to, where, where upon to discover them? Exactly. Put the thing about where we came from. Also, help me. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know, as more time goes by on this one, I kind of do want to see it again. I, I feel like I, I, I want, I want to soak it a bit more. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to see it when it comes out on Blu-ray. I'll, yeah, I'll check it out. I think then. when home release comes, I want to get the super duper 3D deluxe Blu-ray edition, and that is, that is no doubt going to be in a new Scamander case. Oh yeah, clearly, That's clearly, definitely yeah, going to happen. Yeah, totally. But it is worth checking. I think if you're a Harry Potter fan, you, you, you shouldn't miss it. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you've got to go and see this. Hell, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you probably have already seen this. The box office does seem to indicate that. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's done alright. But um, I quite liked it. I didn't think it was amazing, but. 
but you know, it was it was yeah. perfectly it fine. Was, it was enjoyable. Yeah, it, it was, was a good starter to the franchise. Number six. What can I say except you're welcome? But one song last year that was catchier than that song from Zootopia. <laughs> try everything. You try think that everything. was catchier than Try Everything? Definitely. I will admit, over Christmas, every time I was showering in the morning, I kept putting the Moana soundtrack on my phone. I'm addicted to that song. Mm. That's I closest know. you'll ever come to sharing a shower with Dwayne Vought Johnson. Oh, life is full of disappointment. Right but anyway, Moana <laughs> is good. It's great. It's, good. it's, it's really great. great. Well, this thing, I don't think it's a, a Disney classic, but I think it's a really, really good Disney See, I, I definitely think it is. You think Absolutely. it's a Yeah, I think, I think it's more of a classic than Big Hero 6. Absolutely. I think Big Hero 6 is very is, is sort of against the Disney grain because of its superhero. Not by dislike, because I I re- I mean they're, they're still on that. Yeah, on what is being referred to as like the third golden age. Yeah, so, I, I think Moana is very very good. I did really like it. I do think Dwayne Johnson in a Disney movie is a, is a brilliant idea. And Jimmy Clone um, plays a big shiny crab. Yes, and Jermaine Clamp plays a big shiny crab, and uh, Alan Tudyk gets to play uh, a chicken, a chicken, <laughs> which is so he's, he's gone from playing a robot to a chicken. No, then... didn't he? It was chicken oh, to a robot. Chicken to a robot. Chicken to a yeah. robot. Yeah, but, but, um, but that is if you're yeah, if you're a parent robot, looking to take it? kid to a movie, take them to Moana. They're gonna love it, um, and then you're gonna love it too because it's a Disney movie. And it's a, it. it's a really good one. It's not Home on the Range. <laughs> exactly. That, I, We're I, not in those dark days anymore. Funnily people. enough, I came across a BuzzFeed article the other day about uh, worst Disney movies. Home on the Range made that list. Really? Well, yeah. BuzzFeed is, and I quote, a flaming pile of garbage. A failing pile of oh, garbage. That oh. was it, yeah. yeah. I'm, I am so sorry, Supreme Leader. I will try and get you right in future. <laughs> Do you think that's... You know when they reveal who Supreme Leader Snoke actually is? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. yeah. We're going really anti-Trump. We today. really I are. I'm, I'm starting to be off strong. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, we're starting off on on really the wrong foot for 2017. Um, so give me some film news. Go on, give some me real quick. A little more. Okay, this is pretty ace. We were just talking about Star Wars. Yeah. Um, Woody Howson, and this is actually happening yes. now. He's just been confirmed. Um, he's going to be playing uh, sort of like a mentor figure to Han Solo in the Han Solo where Solo adventure comes out he's next year. Obi Two Kenobi. Oh, fantastic work. <laughs> But yeah, um, he uh, obviously is sort of like the mentor figure to Katniss Everdeen in the Hunger Games. Yeah. Essentially, he's doing something similar. But I figured out there is... Well, I didn't figure out. The internet told me. Yeah. Um, Star Wars, the Han Solo film, and the Hunger Games, they share a producer. Oh, yeah. So I feel like that's probably why she was like, hey, I know someone that could be a mentor. As long as he oh, plays he? it the way he did Zombieland, for instance, that kind of a mentor. I mean, uh, like Han Solo having uh, having Tallahassee, uh, Tallahassee yes. as, as a mentor. Get, that's, get, that's him behind, get him behind the Twinkies. Yeah, totally in, totally yeah. in. I'll, leave, I'll take that above a Zombieland sequel, even. And that's the I don't film. think we're ever going to get that. That was going to be a show at one no, point, the no, sequel. I saw the pilot. It was really good. Um, Zombieland 2 is happening. It is officially happening, Zombieland 2. It's a fish. It's, it's a fish. Whether or not anyone comes back for it, no one knows, but but it is a fish. Yeah. Uh, right, so let's plug the podcast real quick. If you want the extended version of this show, usually it's the films we don't get to fit into the broadcast version, but this week it's going to be the stuff that's left over yeah. from before Christmas. It's, it's a lot of us rambling and wrapping up, tying up Bob loose ends. Exactly. Yeah. With a nice little, neat, neat little bow on the end. <laughs> it's all wrapped up in a nice little package, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic. I just thought it was. Um, so pop along to ACAST, Deezer, uh, iTunes, TuneIn, yeah, tune any podcast platform. Type in off screen and we're on there. Enjoy. You get, you get a little extra bang for your buck. And, and who doesn't want more bang for the buck? That's, that's always the thing. So uh, let's talk real quickly then about the young offenders. Yes. I don't know anything about Right, this. so this is from writer-director Peter Foote. Uh, this is like an, this is an Irish boys' comedy. This is actually based on a true story. This is based on the story of... Um, do you remember when there was a ship... There was a ship full of cocaine uh, crashed off the coast of Ireland? No. And there was 440... What was that? This is 2007, I think it was. Okay. There, was there was 440 million, million euros, sorry, of cocaine in bales... Off oh, the Irish man. coast. Why is this not being made into a film sooner? That was it. So what you've got then are two wayward 15-year-old boys who decide they want in on this. They want to go down. They want to find a bale of cocaine and sell it for a million euros. That's I think it's four million euros you get per bale. Mm. And um, right. But everyone who's going and getting the cocaine is being arrested. Yeah, na- naturally enough, the police I mean, are pretty much pitching you would up. Hope and, so, yeah. Yeah, the police are pitching up and just taking everyone as they come out with their <laughs> bales of coke. So these two fifteen-year-olds, though, realise that they are technically young offenders under the law. They would be considered young offenders, so they can actually, as they put it, get away with anything. They can do whatever they want. So they set off on a BMX journey across the length of <laughs> Ireland to get to, they go from Cork to the coast to try and find their fortune, as it were. We've got a clip of them discussing what they would do with this money. Imagine if we had a million euros. What would you like to do? Think of something, think of something. What would you like to do? 
Pick anything you like. What I would you like to do? Put me on the spot. Um, anything like come on. But you know, like, what's, what's the budget? One million? You just said it. I. Do you want me to choose like an activity or like an object? Whatever you want to do, just pick something. I mate. don't know, like skydiving. Grant. No bother, you can go skydiving. You, I'll, I'll get your plane and the parachute and you can skydive all the time, whenever you want. Ah. Where would you like to live? Mansion. Mansion? Grand, not a bottle. We need a butler, or Yeah, to clean the house, yeah, we get one of them fellas, like. Mm, Batman. Yeah, where well, he could run he could run the gaff with his like, English <laughs> accent, why would be unbelievable, oh, man? Imagine like, waking up to that every morning. Yeah, wait. Well, <laughs> what? Wow, wait. Was that <laughs> right, so that's our two leads there, and I forget their names offhand. Uh, they are Alex Murphy and Chris Wally, and they mm. are surprisingly great. You they sound really funny. It is actually a really funny yeah. film. You go into it thinking, I just from the poster alone, which I think is all we really got to see before being shown it, and you know, you, it looks like you know ragamuffin, you know. Five, you know, five for a quid kind of comedy that we get sort of this side of the pond. You watch it and it plays like the Irish chav version of Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion or Dumb and Dumber or Superbad or something like that. <laughs> Just like, um, a, like a buddy comedy. Yeah, yeah, buddy comedy, but with a sort of a, a, a distinctive personality. You know, in that way that you would describe Night at the Roxbury, its characters have a very specific personality. Same kind of thing here. Um, Really well cast, really sharply written. They play very nicely with the characters. There's a lot of laughs in there. Um, I, I really was impressed by it. I just looked Peter Foot up, and I don't really seem to recognise anything he's done. So, mm. yeah, failing for me. But uh, I really liked it. I was really sort of impressed by it. It, had, it sounds pretty good. It had nasty humour. It had heartfelt humour. And at the end of the day, I, I just found myself laughing and actually caring about these characters. And if you get the chance to check it out, definitely do. Um, I would say I was, I was just, I expected nothing. I was solidly impressed. With the latest film news and reviews, this is Off Screen, the on screen radio show. And we're back. So you know where we've got to go now, Mr. Allen? We've got to go to. La La Land. Are you excited about La La Land? I've been excited for about a year and a half to go to La La Land. <laughs> right, so, so let's be honest. Nobody, I'm annoyed that people have seen it already. <laughs> that's it. I mean, nobody expected for one second that Damien Chazelle was going to follow up Whiplash with a full-blown musical. And yet, here we are. So what you have is the, uh, the the classic Hollywood, you know, star-crossed lovers kind of a story. You've got the jazz pianist whose job, whose dream in life is to own a jazz club, to run his own jazz club. He's played by Ryan Gosling, because why wouldn't he be? Um, you've then got the aspiring actress, the sort of barista, who's constantly going out on auditions and being being rejected and turned away, and she's played by Emma Stone, because why wouldn't she be? <laughs> and the pair come together, and it's basically the story of their relationship and how they pursue their dreams and how basically the evil machinations of Hollywood and life itself conspire to bring them down. And it's a musical, and John Legend is in it, and there's a cameo with J.K. Simmons. And you know what? Here's a clip. I got a call back. What? Come on. <laughs> For what? For a TV show. The one that I was telling you about earlier. The Dangerous Minds meets the OC? Yeah. Congratulations, that's really incredible. Exciting. I feel like I said negative stuff about it before. What? It's like Rebel Without a Cause, sort of. I got the bullets. Yes. You've never seen it. I've never seen it. Oh my. You know it's playing at the Rialto. Really? Yes. You should, go, I mean, I'll, 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 I can take you. Okay. You know, for research. For research? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Monday night, 10, 10 o'clock. Yeah, great. Okay. For research. Who just knows movie theater screening times off the top of their head? That is weird. I didn't pick up on that in the film. But uh, Me, but when I used to work at a cinema. There you go. Yeah. No, see, I didn't pick up on that, that, that during the film because I was too busy enjoying the hell out of it. All the hype that you've heard for this is actually justified. You watch it, you think, actually, yeah, there's really something to this. Within minutes, you're into the swing of it. It's romping, nostalgic fun. But, and this is this is what really impressed me about it, there is a point in the film in which John Legend turns up. And John Legend is a, a, a contemporary jazz musician in the film. And uh, he tells Ryan Gosling's character, uh, you know, where he's going wrong with this aspiring to, you know, run the jazz club kind of thing. Mm. And he tells him, the problem is... You hold all these people, all these classic jazz musicians in, in such solid regard. You won't deviate from what they do, but they were revolutionaries. How can you respect the revolutionaries when you yourself are such a traditionalist? And it's something that actually 
kind of serves as a meta statement about the film itself, which on the one hand is a classic old timey Hollywood rompy Fred Astaire kind of a musical. And then the other, other, other end of the spectrum, it manages to infuse enough of a contemporary spirit and enough sort of, you know, new sentiment into it, a lot of a sort of a world-weary 21st century kind of a mindset into it. You think, yes, this kind of works. And one of the ways in which it does it is this film clocks in over two hours. It's something like two hours and 13 minutes. Something like that, that, yeah. And at the same time, though, there's only about six or seven actual musical numbers in it. So it's not the musical, the big romping musical you think it is. It's actually a little bit more subdued to that. This is not Sweeney Todd. You know what I mean? This is not an opera. It is a musical, and there's a lot of dialogue in it, and it works. And because you've got, you know, great writing from Damien Chazelle in there as well, what you have are wonderful performances from uh, Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone, who, is it the third time they've starred together? Uh, yeah, by my count, yeah. Uh, Gangster Squad Gangster and, Squad and uh, the, Crazy the, Stupid Love. That's it. Yeah. I which I really like. I, I like that yeah. as well. Is that the one with Steve Carell and the, the hot babysitter? From yes, yeah, from What's America's Next Top Model. I I, I forget her name. Yeah. Anna Lee Tipton. Anna Lee Tipton. Anna yeah, Lee Tipton. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The chick from America's Next Top Model. That that's all her name was. Um. So yeah, this is the thing. You've got there. They've got really great, really infectious, really easy chemistry, and it works. And part of what makes it work is that they both have such great comedic timing. Now Emma Stone doesn't really get much in the way of swagger and laughs. Her character's a little more downbeat than Ryan Gosling's, but Ryan Gosling as you could hear from the clip, gets that sort of, hey, kind of classic leading man, jovial swagger it, it's the kind of thing, you think, give him 10 years, he's Clooney, you know, that that kind of thing, this is, your Clooney could have done this at 28 you know, that kind of, actually, Ryan Gosling's what 38? He's in his 30s now yeah, he's about 38 isn't he? He's moving up there yeah because Ava Mendez is 42 but, is uh, she really 42? She's 42, Dad. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so yeah, that's it. But yeah. uh, no, really loved it. Really, really enjoyed the hell out of it. I can see in every sense why the hype is there. So, how often do you get to hear that case? The hype is justified. Yeah, not very often. Probably just like maybe what two or three times a year, where it's really <laughs> exactly it's really earned. We I don't guess. get a revenant every week, you know? <laughs> and even then, to an extent, yeah. that, that could be argued. <laughs> you could be argued. Do you not like the revenant? No, it's, that's not what he said at all. No, I did. Do, I liked it. Do you not it think immensely. it lived up to its hype? Um. No. Oh, okay, no judgment. That's no. fine. That's fine. I liked it immensely. That's fine. I just, yeah. Okay. Hey, we, that was a severe yeah, hard we, drain. We can we can let it go. I already hate you a little, so let's just not push it. <laughs> Before we just fight. <laughs> right on. Okay, so I'm going to fight you. <laughs> it's going to be like the end with like, it's gonna Tom, like Tom Hardy. And we're going like, to gonna set up fist fight all year now, you realise. Oh, man, we luck. should do that until... Three o'clock. <laughs> when does that come out? At school. When does, when Is does, it the uh, beginning of fist March? Fist fight come out? Are we going to be March, I think? Something like that. I can't wait. I'm, I am looking forward I'm so to looking that. Forward to it. Right, uh, I'm give us some news, I've, I've got some news, I'm going to tie it into the other land. So okay. uh, let's talk about the Golden Globes. Because okay. that was over the weekend. I'm just we'll going have to be wrap. quick on it, because there's a lot to say about the Golden Globes. We can save some for later and get the clip I'll, I'll just talk about the main ones. So, okay, okay um, two uh, best motion picture winners, as per usual. Mm-hmm. Uh, drama, Moonlight this year. I heard, yes. Yes, which I've seen. Have you seen Moonlight? Yes. Yeah. And we'll talk about it later. Jammy Kit. It's very good. And uh, musical or comedy. Guess what that was? <laughs> was it The Martian? It was La La Land. <laughs> Do you know what? The Martian was so much funnier than many of the films that were nominated for Best very Comedy Very true, Martian. isn't like, it? Like, Joy was nominated. It is funnier than Joy. It is funnier than Joy, but, you know, there are, there are hemorrhoid treatments that are funnier than Joy, let's be honest. And I'd rather have a hemorrhoid treatment than, than watch, watch Joy, Joy again. Yeah, I'm sure he would. Yeah. But, uh, yes, yeah, so La La Land cleaned up, didn't it? Absolutely. It cleaned up, and then whilst we were having the press show for it, all of the, exe- all the execs and the PR people were in a meeting discussing how to, str- how to strategize their victory. Yeah. So, how do we move forward? Yeah, go for yeah, it. Yeah, uh, it actually uh, broke the record for uh, Golden Globes wins. Uh, it did. It, it, won, seven. it won seven. Yeah. Um, the next one down uh, is uh, it's a share between uh, One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest and uh, a Midnight Express. Won six each. Wow. Yeah, so pretty impressive. I have some news on La La Land. I'll get to real quick. Okay. Um, Lionsgate exec has said we are actually considering doing a stage musical of this. I mean. Which obviously, we kind that of was... walked out of the pressure saying that's going to be in the West End. In obviously, obviously that was years. a foregone yeah. conclusion, right? Oh, it's totally going to be a stage show. Totally. It's going yeah. to be a West End show. It's going to be a Broadway show. La La Land is going to be around for a long time. And uh, let put it this way I think La La Land is going to be remembered as a film at the end of a certain sentiment. 
at the end of a certain cultural cultural sentiment. I think it yes. comes along at the perfect time. Everybody get it seen before January 20th. <laughs> because then we're not allowed to see any musicals, anything with any gay connotations, mm-hmm. nothing ever again. Well, put it this way, aren't we lucky that within two weeks of... Uh... Do you know what, Van? You are part of the press. Yeah, I know. But... So you're, you're going to be shot soon. I know, right? I'm shot. Yeah. Oh, and I'm mixed race, so... Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to miss you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doomed. But, uh, yeah, this is the thing. Within two weeks of Trump taking office, we have uh, John Wick 2. So, yeah, I think that sets the tone nicely. <laughs> but also, John Wick 3 is coming out. So, if only. Yeah, if, if only. only, if only. Yeah, <laughs> right, so, let's, let's talk about Underworld Blood Wars, then. Because, God right. forbid, we I don't. mean, first of all, that's a ridiculous title. It really is, isn't yeah. it? So, um, just out of interest, have you ever met an Underworld fan? <laughs> Uh, solid question. No. Yeah. No, I couldn't. I have. I could not point one out in the no, street. I right. haven't. I have literally never met a person. And I asked around the other day. I mm. asked around. We were waiting for the screen to start, and I asked, "Does anybody know an Underworld fan?" Yeah. And uh, I found one person. One person who knew a guy who was a Kate Beckinsale fan. Not necessarily. Not an, an Underworld, Underworld fan. fan. So this is the question. These movies make money because they're rubbish, and this is the fifth one. So the, and they do make money. So yeah, who's seeing them? I think it's the thing where like they make them for just cheap enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think this is actually something like this is something like seventy mil. This, this one, the sequel. But okay. Uh, so okay, so Underworld Five. This follows on from the last one, which took place in the future and had humanity having discovered the existence of vampires and wells and hunted them to near extinction. Um, the main character is a death dealer, which is like a vampire assassin or special forces agent. She's played by Kate Beckinsale, Celine. She had a daughter in the last one who was like, I think, like 10 years old, who was like a hybrid. She's half vampire, half werewolf, and her blood can change the world. And the movie ended with her being shipped off to be secure and kept from the vampires and the werewolves so that they can't harvest her blood and change the world. Now we have mm, okay. film number five, in which that's still the status quo. Um, humanity seems to have forgotten about vampires and werewolves because it doesn't come up once. And um, we're in another. Uh, Eastern European country that's unnamed because cheap tax breaks and everything's shot through a blue filter and um, oh yeah that's it Celine is tasked by the vampire elders the council of the vampire elders to go into she's given amnesty to go into their castle their fortress and train up a new generation of death dealers to fight the war against the werewolves because they've got a new leader named Marius who's played by Tobias Menzies who's on a mission to kill any shred of respect you have for him post Game of Thrones and uh, also, Charles dances in this, and you can play a drinking game. <laughs> of of course he is. yeah, you can play a drinking game of spot the Game of Thrones actor with this one. I'm telling you, and of course, her amnesty and her training these people up is uh, all a smoke screen. And before you know it, she's framed for murdering a bunch of vampires, and she's put on the run with Theo James to go and find some hide with some vampire Vikings. And I'd forgotten how I even have the will to live anymore. Here's a clip. You are an extremely difficult person to keep track of. Stop tracking me! I'm not tracking you. I'm looking for Eve. I'm the very last person who could help you find my daughter. So then listen to me. The Lycans are moving again. No, this is different. They're organized. They have a new leader. His name is Marius. I'm finished with this war. Well, it's not finished with you. They could have killed you. But clearly their mission was to capture you. Your daughter's blood. It's a prize. And if they find her, if they use it, Marius's power will be limitless. Well, then I hope she remains lost. So Kate Beckinsale there, showing all the enthusiasm you expect of someone who's still in this film series after all this time. Um, As I say, I've never met an Underworld fan in my life. I certainly am not one. Um, I like the third movie, the prequel one. That was that was pretty good. That was the one with Michael Sheen and Rise Rona, of the Lycans, isn't it? Rona Meech- yeah, yeah, Rise of the, yeah, Lycans. Rise of the Lycans. That was pretty good yeah. because it was a simplistic stripped down story that you know took place outside of this need for a triannual CG amplified backflipping contest. And this time around, you, you, we're back with the triannual CG enhanced backflipping contest. But this time, they've given up any pretense of keeping this in the realm of the supernatural and the explainable. And now we've just gone full superhero. Um, and, yeah. I mean, it makes money, doesn't it? it? It makes money. It makes money. Do you remember 47 Ronin and my issue with 47 Ronin, which was that there was a point in the film at which they simply turned around and, and I'm paraphrasing, but they literally came out with, by the way, I'm magic. And suddenly <laughs> Keanu Reeves had magic powers. This movie literally does that with, by the way, I'm a superhero. And Quick side note about that film. Yeah. Uh, that cured my uh, four-day-long uh, bout of insomnia. <laughs> 
Uh, like genuinely, I could not sleep for three or four days, Kelly. and then I started watching it, and I was out like a light. <laughs> Kelly Needham did as well in the screen. We saw it on Boxing Day a few years ago. Kelly Needham passed out like ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so, we've got so, John Wick. It's fine. Yeah, we've got John Wick. That's cool. Um, but yeah, this is just more of the same. This is this is a, a new level of of gumph being added as well with the whole superhero bilge. Nobody seems. I mean, there's no bad performances, but nobody seems particularly bothered that they are there. And there's no characters in there. Nothing's ever. They don't ever stop and explain anything. They just run through it as if it's a rehash of Ultraviolet, that Mila Jovovich vampire. I remember movie, that. Yeah. Which, which this has now become because it's vampires in the future. Mm. So this I always get that confused with uh, Shelley's for on. Aeon, Aeon Flux. Flux. Yeah. yeah, it's awful. But having said that, if you're a fan of the Underworld series, and I assume you have to exist, I assume you're out there somewhere. Maybe you live in a cave. Right in. In. Yeah. Tweet us. Let Tweet us know us. that you are. Please alive. let us know that you exist, because we need to know someone. We need to find just anyone mm. who's an Underworld fan. Just someone, please. If you are that person, you're going to love this. However, the rest of the species, the rest of the human race, this is awful. This should not be allowed in cinemas. Just please send this to... Does Sony have a channel? They have a TV channel, don't they? Send it yes. to the Sony movie channel where it belongs, <laughs> or just put it on Netflix and just make a TV show. Just turn it into a TV show, and then I can not watch it. It can it can, it can be <laughs> there just, with... Just ignore it. Yeah, it can be put alongside the Vampire Diaries and the originals. The it, City of... Whatever it is. Yeah, Mortal Instruments. Mortal Instruments, Mortal Instruments. Yeah, Shadow yeah. Hunters, isn't it? Yes. Just, we can put it with those and ignore it. But if you keep putting it in cinemas, we have to watch it, and it's awful. Please, please, please stop. With the latest film news and reviews, this is Offscreen. Time. And we're back, and you can be my wingman anytime, Mister Alan. I'm glad we're back. Oh, cheers! I, I've missed this Iceman or whatever it's called, <laughs> Goose. Well, Iceman's the bad one. Uh, that's that's Valley Kilmer's though. Valley's Kilmer's, yeah. Valley's and Kilmer's. Maverick is Tom Cruise, and Goose is uh, Anthony Edwards, yeah. who's a director now. I didn't realise. Actually, directs Anthony films. Edwards of ER fame. Yeah, of ER, yeah. No way. The one who broke all our hearts when he did that hour-long dying episode. Oh, um, that's just with. Yeah, R- River Song. Yeah, yeah. He name? and Alex Kingston Alex pop Kingston. off to like the Caribbean or somewhere, and he dies. And he just for an dies. Hour. Yeah, that is. Yeah, oh, that, that was, is that destroyed me as a person. So, um, speaking of destroying me as a person, let's talk about Manchester by the Sea. <laughs> I'm kidding, it's not really like that. It is an emotional film, actually, though. Yeah. Um, so Manchester by the Sea, which is by uh, Kenneth Lonergan, isn't it? Mm. Kenneth Lonergan. Uh, this interesting story. This was developed as a vehicle for Matt Damon to make his directorial debut. Yeah. So he was going to star in it as well. And do the directorial and do the directing side of it. And uh, Kenneth Lonergan had actually written it, and then Matt Damon, I think he stopped to do The Martian, needed time after The Martian. He did, yeah. Kenneth Lonergan is known more as a writer. Yeah, than but else. he's then yeah. he's then gone and directed this instead, and he's cast Casey Affleck in his place. Uh, Casey Affleck, incidentally, thanked Matt Damon for this. He did, during the Golden Globe speech. speech, because that's absolutely what you should do. Yeah. Uh, thank the actor who dropped out and allowed you to take his role. <laughs> um, so, right, so Casey Affleck is, he's a, like a, a building janitor, you know, an apartment building. Yes. He's, he's the janitor, he's, he's the guy you call to come and unclog the toilet and fix the window, and this is his life. And it's, it's Bit of a crap job. Bit of a crap job, exactly. And it's demeaning, and <laughs> it's demeaning, but it's, it's what he does to just get through the day. He's kind of a closed-off guy, he spends his nights alone in bars picking fights. Anyway, he, when his brother, his older brother, unexpectedly dies, well, unexpectedly, he had a heart condition, he passes away, he's forced to go home to uh, Manchester by the sea, Massachusetts, uh, where he discovers that he has, in fact, been named the guardian of his teenage nephew. His teenage nephew, who's only about 18 months off being 18 and being on his own anyway, and it's about the, the, the sort of, it's about going home again. It's about Casey Affleck's character going home and sort of facing the sort of life that he'd really left behind, that he'd walked away from, and basically being drawn back into actually being an active member of a family and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a clip. I don't understand. Which part are you having trouble with? Well, I can't be his guardian. Well, uh... I mean, I can't. Well, naturally, I, I assumed Joe had discussed all this with you. No, he didn't. Uh, I, I, sorry, I have to say I'm somewhat taken aback. He can't live with me. I live in one room. <laughs> well, but Joe has provided for Patrick's upkeep. Food, clothes, etc. And the house and the boat are owned outright. I can't commute from Boston every day until he turns 18. Uh, what about my uncle Donnie and Aunt Teresa? Joe didn't feel that Patrick really had any special relationship or feeling about them. And now, as I, I think you know, they've moved out to Wisconsin, I believe. Minnesota. It was my impression that you'd spent a, a lot of time here over the years. I was just a backup. 
It was supposed to be Donnie. I'm just a backup. So, Casey Affleck there, learning the news that he is going to become a, sur- a surrogate stand-in parent. He is the backup, as he puts it. Now, first of all, Casey Affleck is terrific in this. There's um, there's a lot of time jumping within the film, a lot of uh, looks, because you, you have the present-day stuff, mm. and you have a lot that explores the relationship between the brothers, that explores the relationship between ex-partners, that uh, and relationships between parents, and there's a lot of time jumping, because you, you do get to see a younger Casey Affleck, and he plays it to perfection. There's not really much of a there's no physical uh, makeup effects or anything like that and they have just relied on Casey Affleck to play himself younger and he does it very very well um, brilliant performances across the board in this genuinely fantastic Kyle Chandler is the brother uh, Michelle Williams uh, just, oh, she's always she's great so good in this yeah. there is a there's, there's one scene towards the end of this film and it's it's just dialogue it's just two people stood talking for maybe 90 seconds and you just sit there and think my God, she's good. When did Jen from Dawson's Creek get this good? She's been incredible for at least, what, 12, 13 years, something mm. like that? Well, I mean, I'm thinking back on teaching Mrs. Tingle at this point, but... Uh... Well, if you want to really stretch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, she's so good. Uh, really amazing yeah. writing from Kenneth Lonergan. His uh, his style, his, his visual flair for this is actually so on point. Um, but it's, it for me, it's more... It, there's a there's a smartness to the writing. There is, I mean, there's stuff in there that you just sit and think. In the hands of a, a slightly less invested Helmer, you would have locked that out. There's, there is a scene that literally lasts five seconds that is Casey Affleck having cut his hand and his nephew asking him what happened. That's it for five seconds. Mm. That is a whole scene. And it's brilliant. And it will have you howling with laughter. This is a movie that can genuinely take you from hysterics to tears and back again. And it does it so effortlessly, so wonderfully, and with such resilience and so many great performances. You sit there, wow, okay, let's, let's bring this to the Oscars and let's see how this fares. Because I have a feeling this might do pretty well. Yeah, it's one of yeah. those films where it's going to be nominated for screenplay, oh, definitely, director, definitely screenplay, and actor without... Yeah, mm, I think but so. But it's it's looking like it's going to be a two horse race between uh, Casey Affleck and uh, Denzel Washington, that's which is story. pretty. That's a good mashup. That's a good, isn't it? Yeah, obviously Denzel he's won uh, twice previous. Mm. Casey's been nominated for best supporting. He's never won. I would love him to win. Give me some news then before we finish the top ten. A little bit of news. Let's see what we have. Uh, Keegan Michael Key. You know him. You love him. I'm a big fan. Did you see his return to the Daily Show? As oh, Luther? I did. As Luther uh, Barack Obama's uh, anger, anger translator. translator. Yeah. Just incredible. <laughs> Like, I didn't know that I needed it so bad, and when I saw it, I felt better. <laughs> if you've not seen this, check it out on YouTube. It is so worth it. Uh, Obama and Luther. It, uh, Obama and Luther, yeah. Jo- Jordan, Jordan Peele is playing Obama. Yeah. And, yeah. So, uh, Keegan Marquis, he's got himself a new project, and this has kind of come out of nowhere, but it makes so much sense. It does in a strange way, yeah. Doesn't, yeah. Uh, he's joined uh, Shane Black's The Predator. Yeah, and uh, brilliant. Just wonderful. Just, I mean, I was, I was taken aback. It's inspired when I casting. It. Yeah. Really, really great. Good. Fantastic. Because well, we've got uh, Boyd Holbrook, is, I think, the lead in this now and yeah you've got olivia munn as which, the girl which is pretty interesting i think boy i mean i think just logan and I narcos i don't really know him i don't know him from anything really so have you started watching narcos yet? no i've not watched Narcos. He's really yet. good in that and also he's got a small but pretty good role in uh what's the liberati film oh uh, behind, behind the, the candelabra yeah he's really strong in that so maybe like this will elevate him a little bit mm. you've got olivia munn uh boy holbrook yeah and uh also uh yep. from from uh um what's it called uh moonlight uh oh, trevante rhodes trevante rhodes yeah I remember i knew his surname was rhodes because rhodes is the name that leaps out to me being an iron man fan there you go yeah Rhodey. But uh, yeah, Trevante yeah, Rhodes, who's apparently going to be Boyd Holbrook's art marine buddy. Yes, they're, they're marines together. They are marines friends. together, and I don't think that Keegan Marquis' character has been confirmed yet. But he, he'll probably be funny. He'll probably have a little bit oh, of dramatic chops. It's I'm a hoping it's like a black movie. Of course, he's going to have some great lines. I really hope it's sort of like I don't know, like uh, Bill Paxton in yeah. Aliens. I want him to be Hawkins. <laughs> yes. That's it. I just want him to be Hawkins. <laughs> I want to be Hawkins meet, mixed with his Keanu character. That would be incredible. That, that works yeah. for me. That's perfect. I and mean, of course, Shane Black was Hawkins. And yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's all, totally, totally going to work. Uh, so we've got that coming, I think it's in March 2018, March next year. It is, yeah, yeah. but they're, they're really like pushing for it to be yeah. a big film. Yeah. On which note, let's finish the top ten then. Number five. Fitties in space. Fitties in space. <laughs> 
guys, yeah. passengers, which literally is that. Finney's in space. You know, it is a movie in which you're asked to sympathise with this uh, gorgeous 28-year-old woman who is condemned to a life of endless entertainment, five-star luxury accommodation, uh, Michelin, Michelin star dining, and sex with Chris Pratt. And you just think there's not really much of a character conflict in that one, but they do ring it out of there. It is, on the outside of the ship, it's sunshine. It's the movie Sunshine. On the inside of the ship, it's like the reboot of Lost in Space. And you know what? It's, it's pretty good. I think critics gave it a hard time. I don't think it deserved anywhere near the, the rough ride it got. Mm. Um, it didn't make, like, made yeah, nothing in America. It did. Yeah. This is the thing. I think it's it's one of those, it's going to find its audience on home release. And it's a shame, yeah. though, because the visuals would have been so great on IMAX. I guess it, it, it was kind there. of built on being a star vehicle. Mm. And I just don't think we've got the climate for that. We don't want to have star vehicles anymore, do we? Number four. Silence. <laughs> You're so proud of that, aren't you? I really am. Uh, I like Silence very much. Um, I'd say it's, it's Scorsese at his masterful best. You've got terrific performances from Andrew Garfield, from Liam Neeson, from... Uh, Liam Neeson's. Adam Driver. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking of as well. Um, Kieran Hines pops up, doesn't he? Uh, Kieran Hines pops yeah. up very briefly at the very beginning. And yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. And it was. I think it's over long. I do mm. think at, it pushes itself. I think it's 2 hours 40, something like that. Oh, I thought it was three hours it clocked in it. And I think it's oh, it's something like fifteen minutes short of three hours. Yeah, I'm um, sure there's like there's a five hour cut out there somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure, there is. Yeah. You could lock this down to you could actually lock this down to a hundred minutes if you'd locked out a lot mm. of the more pondering visual stuff in there. But I do think that that's part of the core personality of the film, and I think you'd have a loss with it if you are a, a dedicated cinephile. Then you have to see this anyway because it's Scorsese. Yep. But uh, you know, if you just want to respect the master at work. Go and see it. Check it out. It's worth it. And it's got some terrific performances in it. Number three. A Monster Calls. Which you've seen. Go on. I have seen. Um, oh, man. That was, <laughs> Did you love it? That was heart-wrenching. It really was, wasn't it? Yeah. So Felicity Jones kind of affirms who she is now. She's just she's reached a, just a new calibre of actress. Of Jane um, Ursa. <laughs> of Jane Ursa, yeah. Exactly. And, uh, you know, Nibsy. Our boy Nibsy. Our boy Nibsy. He, he's fantastic in it. Yeah. yeah. Nibsy! Yeah, fantastic performances across the board. Um, I think me and you, we shared one very minor sort of quibble, which it was, was uh, Sigourney Weaver's accent. Yeah. But you completely get over it. Oh, you do. And yeah. it's such like five minutes. It's a great contemporary fairy tale, isn't it? Yeah, it's it just perf- and it's also kind of an all round perfect for the family kind of a it dark is, yeah. gothic fairy tale. I think the kids will adore the animation. I think they will. There's some beautiful animation in it. Yeah. But genuinely, if you if you want a a, a great night, an mm. unexpectedly great night it's out re- with the family, it's, it's go and see really this. Funny in places. It is as well. well yeah. Yeah. Number two, Star Wars Wagwan. Wagwan. <laughs> Wagwan. <laughs> Which I absolutely love. Uh, I've seen it a couple of times now. Have you seen Have you had the pleasure? Of course. It, well, yes. Oh, of course you do. We saw it together. Come on. Yes, sorry. I'm, sat next I'm on to you, default. Dude. I'm on default. Um, I, I, I've only seen it once, sir. I was trying to see Assassin's Creed over the holiday and uh, it was sold out. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, it was sold out. So I just went into a screening of Rogue One instead. And uh, you know what? Time well spent. Saw it mm. for like the third or fourth time. Loved the hell out of it again. Big fan of Donnie Yen. My boy Donnie. And, uh, yeah, do you know, love the, love the K2SO, love the story, love the writing, love the third act, which is just, just going to take you to hell and back through Star Wars terrain. And it is proof eternal that there is life in the Star Wars franchise beyond the mere Jedi. And I'm kind of blown away by how effortless it makes it look. Number one. Assassin's Creed. Don't bother with this. Just no. don't see it. I, I saw it and I'm just... We've thinking. not had a proper review yet. So, yeah, give us... You've been, you've been around your mate's give, house give when they've like got a, a new video game, when they've got a new PlayStation game, and they, they refuse to stop playing it for so like you the first half to, hour. So you have to watch it. Yeah, you're yeah. kind of watching them play it for 10 minutes, and then there's a cutscene that lasts five minutes, and they're playing it for another 10 minutes, and there's a cutscene like that. That is basically the experience of watching Assassin's Creed. Um... I mean, it's sold out at nearly every showing over mm. Christmas. Um, I, I saw it in a room full of nerds wearing Assassin's Creed shirts, and they were lapping it up. So I can only assume if you are a big fan of the games, and this is everything you want from it and more. Um, as someone who's never played the games and is just viewing it as a film in its own right, it's a pretty shoddily put together movie. Uh, mm. Justin Curzel, just I don't know what he what happened. I don't Mike know what Breath happened. Was, oh, I said it's so a bad luck is happening. Yeah. Trump's going to president. Well, that's it. I, I don't know what happened. Mike, yeah, it was good. Um, it was this good. is the swagger that he had in Macbeth and the coherence yeah. all gone. His fight scenes, you can't tell what's going on. Michael Fassbender just feels constantly like he knows. Just from seeing the trailer, everything looks brown. 
It, it kind of just, is. Yeah, it's brown. Yeah. It's brown with a hint of blue. Unlike Underworld, which is which just is all blue. blue. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's it. I just, I really, really couldn't be bothered with it. By the time it was over, I was kind of grateful to be honest. And this is all set up for yet more sequels. It's set up for fun. I, I, it's not made the money to justify it. I don't think. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's pulling in the money in the UK. I mean, it's five mil this last weekend. It is. It has flopped a big time in America. I think it's one of those that once it gets to China, you know, once get, get back China. 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 As it gets to China, as Donald Trump would say, then, uh, then yeah, it's, it's going to pull in all the money and it'll lead tomorrow's another day. With the latest film news and reviews, this is Off Screen, the on screen radio show. And we're back and dancing. So, are we going to live by night, Mr. Allen? Would you recommend that we live by night? Not terribly, if I'm honest. <laughs> well, set it up anyway. <laughs> set it up anyway. Okay, so this is one of those. This has been a, this this has weirdly become a passion project for Ben Affleck. He's been um, trying to get it made for a long time, he, hasn't he? He really has. Mm. Um, so he's cashed in his Batman cred to get this get this going with Warner Brothers. Um, I think this was originally developed for Leonardo DiCaprio, and yeah. now he's taken it over and he's directed it as well and written it. So this is all him and produced, and this is all Ben Affleck. This is an adaptation of the Dennis Lehane novel. He plays Joe Coughlin, who is the son of a Boston police captain in the 1920s. He's a World War I veteran. He returns home and discovers his uh, he has a niche for the rum smuggling market, because this takes place during Prohibition. So he winds up going to prison, where he falls under the sort of employ of a mafia don, gets out of prison, and becomes his in, his strongman, as it were, the, the leader of his operation in Tampa, Florida. And before you know it, he's basically he's living the American dream, as it were. But you know, threat, there's ch- threats of changing government, threats of you know abolishing prohibition. There's rival crime families, and basically, before you know it, he's got enemies on all sides. We have a clip. I need ID, chief. I expect you'd feel that way. You know what happens if you don't help me? No, I don't. More bodies are going to pile up. More articles like Cigar City Slaughter are going to get written. And the chief's going to get pushed out. You too. Maybe. The difference is, when you get pushed out, someone does it with a bullet to the back of your ear. Chris Cooper there. It's always nice to see Chris Cooper back, isn't it? I love me some Chris so Cooper. So wasted an yeah. amazing Spider-Man too. But uh, yeah, he's he's back. And you know what? Uh, Chris Cooper and uh, is it Robert Glenister? They are the two shining stars. At Robert Glenister. Robert Glenister, yes. That is a, a step up. So you've got Chris Cooper's playing a very sympathetic character. He's mm. a police. He's a police captain himself. Um, he's uh, Elle Fanning's father, and she's a quite. She's an integral pawn in the operation. And, uh, and then you've got Robert Glenister, who's the sort of nasty former former employer slash crime lord. Um, the problem is, this is a passion project with no passion in it whatsoever. The only real effort on Affleck's part seems to have gone into the visual side of it. Um, his writing it just feels very empty, very distant, very cold. And you do kind of come away from it all thinking, this feels like it would have made a really good novel. Oh, it probably did. And and that's why we have a film. And that's it. You look at it and you just think, well, I kind of wish I'd just read the book instead because mm. it feels about as in- it feels like I would have gotten more out of the book. I actually, I actually looked the book up on Wikipedia. and uh, Dennis Lehan, isn't it? Yeah, and there are some weird little uh, changes they've made as well, which are uh, odd to me. But uh, he's got got his the the cinematographer from Shutter Island on this is it Robert Richardson I want to say and as a result the film looks great you can't fault how it looks it mm. looks tremendous but uh, that's it I mean outside of that it play it wants to be a good guy take on Scarface and the problem is it's not it doesn't have the credibility it doesn't have the gumption it doesn't have the swagger it has nothing it just has I mean from the clip alone you can hear Ben Affleck's voice is three octaves lower than everyone else in there mm. because he's doing that whispering thing because I'm intense. I travel the rooftops at night looking for justice. But he's and been better than that. I know. In his own films but as well. This has also got a Return of the Daredevil voiceover, which is really oh, no. annoying. Yeah. <laughs> that is an excellent point. A neighborhood, like anything, has a soul. You know, it it just got that back. You think, I thought we'd move past this, Ben. This is—I mean, don't get me wrong. This is the worst film he's made this, thus far. I mean, this is a real. Yeah, he was free for free. As he I was said three to for you free. Early, yeah. and this is such a step down. Mm. Really, it's one of the, it's, you look at it and you think it's not awful. I don't know, it's not awful, but I think because it's Ben Affleck... You expect a calibre yeah, now. You do. But then again, with Ben Affleck, his success, it very much comes in waves. It does, doesn't, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Like, 
starts off strong with Good Will Hunting, wins an Oscar, yep. then starts making the Paycheck films. Literally made a film called Paycheck. <laughs> <He did. laughs> and then everyone's like, oh, see you later. Yeah. Ben Affleck. And then you keep comes your reindeer back and... games to yourself. Exactly. Excellent, yeah. Paul. That was indeed the sum of all fears. That really was. It wasn't <laughs> yeah. it just. And then uh, comes back as a director, and it's fantastic. Oh, well, um, yeah, it's very much yeah, yeah. topsy turvy, isn't it? I it's, think it's you, you know what Ben Affleck needs now for his next directorial offering: reunite with Casey Affleck. Let's make this happen. Come on, both you could you could rise great. together. Yeah, see them together. Yeah, rise together. Um, but that's the thing. You come away from it, you do kind of sit there and think maybe I should give Public Enemies another sh- another try. You know the oh no uh, never the yeah. Michael Mann. I hated Public Enemies. You hate Public Enemies? Yeah, I was very let down by. I it. was really but, really uh, I, after it. watching this, I'm inclined to give it another try. But, <laughs> just, uh, just comparison sake. Just because yeah. at least that had some some verve, some swagger, and some passion. This so has Marion Cotillard. So uh, yeah, and Marion yeah. Cotillard. This has none of that. Um, it that's does a have shame. It does have Zoe Saldana though. That's always good. Oh, that's um, true. Yeah. Oh, well, by the way, this this does feature the single worst performance you've ever seen from uh, Sienna Miller. And right. That's I, I know that's a low bar. I know that's a low bar, but wow, her her Irish dame is just hilarious, mm. really hilarious. Uh, the other thing with the film as well is, it, it, in the final ten minutes, they cram in something like half an hour's worth of plot, and boy, does it show! <laughs> I mean, it's just this ill-advised. It's some extra story that we had lying around. Yeah, we we had this story yeah. lying around. Why don't you take it? Chuck it in there. But uh, it is not our film of the week. Shock, anyway. horror. What is Pretel? Well, I'm going to give it to Manchester by the Sea. I know. Oh, really? I am. I mean, La- I was, that was genuine shock. It, uh, it, yeah. No, La La Land is really, really good. But I'm going to give it to Manchester by the Sea. I adore Casey Affleck's performances. I think the writing is so mm. strong. It, it's a film that works on every level. It is brilliant. That's great. But even so, that is a pretty fantastic weekend of the cinema. Go see those two together. Yeah, yeah. see Manchester by the Sea. See La La Land. In fact, if you do La La Land first and then Manchester by the Sea, yeah. you start off high and then get low afterwards. <laughs> and then get depressed and then jump off a bridge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to go uh, see La La Land Thursday, go see Manchester on Friday. Why not? Why not? Can't fault you on that. But uh, yeah, don't see Live By Night. That's really not worth your time. Young Offenders, if you get the chance to catch it, definitely check that out. Yeah. Kind of depends where it is, I guess. Yeah, Seek I it think out. it's a lower scale release. Uh, we will talk about the Hurt Business in the podcast extras but uh, yeah so I mean there's some interesting stuff next week's going to be what uh, have we got well I don't know if we're actually going to get the chance to review it but Jackie is out next week really is that next week Jackie is next week fantastic Uh, we also have your man Dev Patel (sighs) he's a lion he's a lion in this one so lion lion is next week I'm looking forward to that Uh, triple X return of Xander Cage and I know for a fact but you've been you've been waiting for years for this haven't you oh yeah I I I might as well have it stamped on me Um, (laughs) (laughs) we've got iBoy yeah. Potentially, which is we're, 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 we're waiting confirmation on that. I Boy, which is uh, a Netflix movie, which is they're, they're going a bit big with for some reason. It's got Maisie Williams in it as well. Yeah, of uh, so. the Game of Thrones, exactly. Yeah. And Split, M Night Shyamalan is back, and yeah. he's brought James McAvoy along for the ride. This could be a bit of a uh, return to form. Well, we know someone that's seen this in advance, Mr. Meekin, and, was a, and, and a was a fan. So yeah, we, I, I have strong hopes. Yeah. It can be quite a tough, tough nut to crack as well. So exactly, yeah, that, that man has he's really, taste, really yeah. high. Although he does, he does claim that the Underworld movies are like a sorbet for him at the beginning of the year. A palate, <laughs> a palate cleanser. cleanser. A palate That's cleanser. He's actually, that doesn't make him a fan, so we still haven't met one. Yeah, but if you are, <laughs> he's as close as we've yeah. got. If you are an Underworld fan, though, please get in touch. We need to know that you exist. Yeah. Really, <laughs> you're like a unicorn to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this has been a candy store production for uh, on screen. We've got all that to come and more next week. I've been Van Connor. I've been as always, Case Allen, and we'll be back. Just show me the way to get out of here, and I'll be on my way. You've been listening to Offscreen. For more news and reviews, visit onscreenfilm.com. Okay, Podcast extras then, Mr. Connor. First of 2017. Now, how exciting. I know. How exciting is it? So, we'll be back. Do you want to do Meryl now? Do Meryl. Do you want to do Meryl now? Let's do Meryl now. Let's do Meryl Let's now. Do Meryl She's so now. overrated. That's it, because Meryl Street became overrated this week. That, that's what happened. We were waiting for it, weren't we? Yeah, it was going to yeah. happen. And we didn't know that she'd become overrated I mean, by to presidential that, that was... decree. Exactly. <laughs> 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 presidential decree. It's been handed down from on high. From, from on his high. ivory slash golden tap. 
<laughs> where he likes himself. his golden showers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that was probably the only award that she's not won yet. Most <laughs> overrated actress, isn't it? Like, <laughs> no, that was a, it's a clean sweep that she's got, I know. It Mel. really is. So, uh, so this, yeah. was, uh, this was a Lifetime Achievement Award, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was uh, the Cecile B. DeMille Lifetime yeah. Achievement Award that they had at the Globe. So last year was Denzel... I think like George Clooney's won it. Just they, it's one of those awards we just, we just give out to everybody. Yeah, 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 as you do. And then uh, they've actually been trying to give it to Mel Streep for a long time, and for a long time she's been saying, "No, I'm I, good." I I've think got I think potentially that one of the reasons she might do it is because it is a lifetime achievement award, and there is that there is sort of the inbuilt implication there that that's what you get at the end of your career. Yeah. Meryl Streep is in no way done. But that, that being said, Warren Beatty got one about twenty years, and then twenty <laughs> years later we finally got rules don't apply. But see, it's so weird giving someone lifetime. Time achievement award when they're like forty five, you know what I mean? That's yeah, I mean obviously me. she's she's like in her sixties now, but she shows no signs of slowing but down. That's it. Meryl Streep's going to be acting into her nineties. Meryl Streep will, will act into the grave, and then yeah. she will out act anyone else from the grave. Yeah, exactly, that's what will happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stephen Colbert made an amazing joke the other day. He was saying something about uh, Trump's um, what's she's. So like leading his campaign, uh, what's her name? Kellyanne Conway. Uh, Kellyanne Conway. Mm. He said, um, a future Meryl Streep role, oh, Kellyanne Conway. <laughs> no, Chelsea could Handler. See that. Chelsea, Chelsea Handler, Handler could so play that. Because Chelsea, Chelsea Handler is a little bit unlikable. Yeah, exactly. So it wouldn't be too much, of an, uh, too much of a stretch, I would So say. the idea then is she did the Lifetime Achievement Award and yes, used yeah. it as a chance to lambast the election of Donald Trump and yeah, his general without behavior. Without saying his name. Without saying, that's very true. Yeah. She was very canny about it, and everyone in the room <laughs> apparently you could just you could hear a pin drop. It was one of yeah. those kind of moments. Well, this is the thing. I think mean, because there's been a lot of controversy about it. Uh, should should we be listening to Hollywood stars talk? About yeah, politics? is it like a Hollywood elitism kind of thing? Mm-hmm. And no, not really. You were le- you elected yeah. a- an elite. You elected a television elite. Exactly. You elected you know you elected a guy who made a cameo in Home Alone too. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know what I, I mean, mean, a lot of people in that room have more political experience, way more political experience than him. <laughs> George Clooney is a UN going, ambassador. <laughs> George Clooney has been arrested for being involved in political protests. <laughs> and I just, Probably outside Trump Tower, or nearby, at least. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that, that was one of the big talk points of the Globes. Uh, another really... There was a fantastic moment with Steve Carell and mm. Kirsten Wiggins. Oh, there this? was, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, they kind of like put in a bid for them to host next year, because it was absolutely hilarious. So I if, heard if you, this, If you've not yeah. seen their, their little I've skit, not seen the bit myself. We, sh- we should watch it later we on should. after the show. It was fantastic. I did see... There was an amazing tweet about the, the Meryl Streep thing. Um, mm. That said, I mean, this is obviously going to get bleeped in the edit. Um, there, was, there was a tweet that said, "Can you imagine if you were such a f- up that Meryl Streep used her, her lifetime achievement speech to point out what a f- person you were?" So well done, well done. <laughs> Do you know what? That that actually is an achievement. That's more than a lifetime achievement. That is that is an all time achievement. If you Isn't are it? that yeah. much of a screw up, but uh, uh, I mean, as I always say, when these kind of just bizarre incidents happen. I cannot wait to see the film of it. <laughs> I really can't. Because you, you couldn't. Gary Busey's you couldn't waiting. This. Gary Busey's waiting, man. He really is. He, he will be Trump. He will be. He will be tr- I think John Goodman will be a good Trump. Uh, no, Don, Tr- John Goodman's too inherently likable. Even when he's playing Even when he's John, John Badman. Yeah, when he's, playing, yeah when he's John Badman, he's still John Goodman at yeah. heart. And Did I tell you about that? He was, he was like on Fallon or something, and he said that originally he wants to be uh, on the radio, like a radio DJ, hmm. and his name was going to be Johnny B. Good. Oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah. So, you've literally been calling him by what would have been his radio exactly. name this entire time. Well played, sir. Thank you very much. Um, so, let me do, let me check in a quick review then, get it out of the way, because we've got yeah. so much to get through. We'll get some news and then we'll do all the yeah. other goodies. So, let's talk about the Hurt Business real quick. Mm. Um, this is a documentary from uh, the, the director of, do you, remember, do you ever see Generation Iron? The bodybuilding, yeah, yeah that it was, is on Netflix. Yeah, it's like yeah, a spiritual sequel to Pumping Iron, which of course is the infamous Arnold Schwarzenegger-based documentary. Uh, the one where he is... <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh my god, that, that documentary is amazing. It's also the fact that it just shows Arnold Schwarzenegger to be just an unabashed psychopath. And yeah. he's, do you know what, it made me love him more. And I met him shortly after watching that and reading his book. Really? Where? Uh, the Sabotage Junket. Years ago. Oh, of course. Yeah. Remember they crashed yeah, yeah. it with Keith Lemon. I remember. And, uh, yeah. Bizarre. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, we live in a messed up world. And, uh, 
Evidently. <laughs> Evidently. But, um, yeah, so you had pumping iron, you've got generation iron, now you've got um, the Hurt Business, which is, in a weird way, the logical continuation of this weird, would-be, spiritually connected franchise. Mm. It's a standalone thing in its own right, but it, what it does is it charts the history of MMA. Now, the thing is, though, they say MMA, what they actually mean is the UFC. Because that that comes up very early on that you know we're talking about MMA, but the legitimate front of MMA is the UFC, is the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and uh, what you get is a look at the humble origins of the. Uh, and I've got a piece of trivia to drop on you in a minute that is going to blow your goddamn mind. I <laughs> swear, to Christ, um, <laughs> really. And uh, so the humble beginnings of it, which was basically it was an MMA fighter that started it all, who came up with and said, "I'm just going to invent this," and yes, and that's what happened. This is a thing now. This is a thing now I've done and it. and it takes you through the early stages when they only had two rules and that comes up in our clip and uh, then obviously how it, it it leapt to prominence in the mid 90s how there was a change of management to what it what it is now and that change of management brought about changes in rules changing structures and marketing and, things like that, and made it into the dominant entertainment force that it mm. is right now which has such a huge fan base which apparently consists of everyone except Meryl Streep um <laughs> because that was one of the things apparently you know if you take away Hollywood all you left with his football and MMA. Although she did say mixed martial arts, credit to her. Yeah, she said it's not arts. Yes, yeah. m- mixed martial arts she did say. But I tell you what, we've got a clip, and this is this is taking you behind the sort of the rules aspect of the MMA and the public perception of it. The corner could stop the fight by throwing in the towel, or the fighter could stop the fight by tapping out, but in no way was the referee supposed to stop the fight. And it got to the point where I had guys getting hurt in a significant fashion, and they did not have the ability to defend themselves. I was screaming at corners to throw towels, but fighters said, don't you ever throw the towel, so they're not going to throw the towel. And now the fighter is unconscious, and I'm supposed to just let him get hit. It was ridiculous, and it was to the point where you know, when it got you know, all over with, I said, hey, thank you very much. I will never do that again. It was not sport. The show itself back then was a spectacle. And as a spectacle, it shocked the world. And when it shocked the world, we created a lot of critics. One independently was a politician who said we were human cockfighting. John McCain, the senator from Arizona. Uh, piece of dirt. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, and it's funny because that piece of dirt ran for office, <laughs> lost. <laughs> and, uh, it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, right, so fascinating documentary in its own way. The only problem with it is it doesn't quite go into the un- the unofficial depths that you want it to. It does feel a little too sanctioned at times. I mean, it's to say, uh, Vlad Yudin obviously has the, the, the connections and everything through having done Generation Iron, so there is that feeling that he obviously has a relationship with the UFC. Um, but there are things in there that you just sit there and think, I feel like by being so endorsed by the UFC, by being mm. quite clearly so supported by having the access that you do, it has restrained the things you can and can't say. So case in point, I, I don't know if you're aware, I, are you terribly aware of the UFC? Um, I know it exists, oh, and no. I've uh, I've seen Warrior. Oh, okay, that's true. Um, well, I, uh, I, I'm becoming increasingly aware of it of late. And uh, the man who runs the UFC is a man named Dana White. He's the president of UFC. And he's generally regarded as a real piece of work. And I've heard of him, you actually, will have yeah. heard of him, yes. Actually, you will probably have heard of him in relation to Ronda Rousey. But uh, who does turn up here? She's like the big name guest in this movie, and gets to be quite frank actually in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a brief exchange in which she says part of why she gets the fight she does is because she gets a lot of hungry young fighters who basically dream of messing up her face and taking her out of Hollywood for a week. <laughs> Um, yeah, fair enough. Um, but they don't get to say the things. They don't get to explain and really delve into the Dana White thing, for instance. Um, the bit of trivia I was going to tell you, by the way, is the reason it's an octagon. Do you know this? The reason they fight in an octagon. Why is that? You're going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> the guy whose name I forget, who's the founder. Kevin Octagon. Kevin Octagon. Yeah. Uh, was sat around one day with John Miles, the director of Conan the Barbarian. I mean, it's not like he's... Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> no, but come on. Okay. Red Dawn, yeah. man. Red oh, Dawn. I don't know Red Dawn. Yeah, I'll let you off. I apologize. Rome. Okay. Yeah, Egg and My Face are in a Did you not see I the apologize. documentary about him? It was an amazing documentary. I've only just seen the Brian De Palma documentary. Oh. Um, the... 
<laughs> documentary about the guy with a Conan. <laughs> okay, but okay, so he's 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 the original. He was like the the, the socially acceptable Joe Esterhurst mm. or uh, or the socially acceptable Paul Verhoeven at the time, and he's the guy that tries to make it an octagon because that's what the Romans fought in. And you oh, think, that's metal. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. He, he he was the most metal man in the world. Yeah. He really was. He was literally the most metal guy. If he and Christopher Lee had ever teamed up, <laughs> boy, we were talking about a supergroup. I mean, <laughs> really. He, Christopher Lee, and Mads, Mikkel- Mads Mikkelsen's brother? <laughs> yeah. Is it Mads Mikkelsen who had the, the metal singing brother? Yeah, is it Lars Mikkelsen? No, no, no. That is Mads Mikkelsen's brother. Someone yeah. had a metal... Brother, we discovered it. A metal brother. <laughs> a metal brother. Someone had a metal metal musician, metal as, musician a, as a brother. brother. I can't remember who it was. I want to say Vincent Cassell, because that's Rusty Squats, isn't it? So It's something like that, yeah. Rusty Squats. What a great oh, name that is. Yeah. It's, there was one of the great European actors at the moment has a brother. Well, I mean, like Viggo Mortensen or someone like that. I but, mean, that wouldn't surprise me. That really wouldn't. But I'm going to find that out. That's yeah, really, let, let us all let's know. Let's find that out, because it was amazing. So if they teamed up with Raw Uthog, then we're talking about a serious metal supergroup. Raw Uthog? Raw Uthog. Raw of the Wave. <laughs> of the Wave. I but feel yeah. like every time we say his name, we need like like a like a sound button of like thunder. <laughs> Raw Raw Uthog. <laughs> yeah. In fact, do you know what? In time for the Tomb Raider reboot, yes, we will do that. We'll do that. <laughs> Raw Uthog and then a crack of thunder. That'll work. But anyway, back to the Herbers, which you say I liked. I wasn't disinterested at any point, but I did feel it. I mean, it's it's a lot more interesting a documentary than the sort of sanctioned ones you get about the WWE, mm. which are really really watered down once you if you know anything about what goes yeah. on. In the, in the in that particular world, um, this has a, a similar effect, but maybe not quite as watered down. It's a little bit more focused than that, but it does feel like they have been made to pull their punches slightly, and that's a real shame because it's nice to see this many great big UFC names all on screen at the same time. It's nice to see John Jones and Chuck Liddell and Ronda Rousey. Noticeably, no Gina Carano, incidentally. Hmm. So I don't know if she was busy, considered herself too important, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, good luck not being Wonder Woman. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Good luck with pedals on Haywire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enjoy that next Stephen C. Miller movie, Gina. Anyway, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's the thing. I, it does feel like you'd, you'd get this between fights on ESPN. Hmm. You know what I mean? You're watching ESPN. It's what you find between, between bounce. It's just a thing. Just a thing. Just a thing. But it's, hey, it's on uh, Video On Demand, DVD, Blu-ray. Mm. If you are a fan of the UFC, check it out. Because, like I say, it's nice to see all those names at the same time. But it's not necessarily something for someone who isn't too fussed about it. And wants like an introduction. I'm not going to recommend it to you personally and say, you know, you'll love this case because you won't. Yeah, exactly. But, like, if it was a documentary about... I don't know, badminton or croquet. Yeah. Same diff. <laughs> right in my street. <laughs> Are you a croquet man, Case? Is that the deal? I just feel like I look like someone who plays croquet. <laughs> <laughs> no, you look like someone that plays competi- competitive checkers, but still. <laughs> Professional, as opposed to checkers. just checkers. recreational co- as checkers. As opposed to recreational yeah. checkers. <laughs> anyway, the BAFTAs. The BAFTAs were announced. Go on. So, as usual with the BAFTAs, we have the best film and an outstanding British film. I feel like you're going to take some umbrage. Some right? umbrage. Go yes. on, go on. Okay, so best film. Here's the five. Arrival. Okay. Yeah, no I'm good. umbrage to be had there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, Daniel Blake. No umbrage to be had there. I like that. I think Blake. it's interesting, but it's there. And I feel like that's going to win best film because you would think they would put that for the outstanding British film. Yeah. Is Oh, isn't Fantastic Beasts, though? We shall get yeah. to that. Uh, La La Land is uh, up for best film, okay. uh, as is Moonlight, and also Manchester by the Sea. So, usual suspects. Right usual there. suspects, yeah. Outstanding British film, mm-hmm. Denial. Okay, seeing it in two weeks' time. Okay. Yeah, it's not even come out yet, and no. it's meant to be pretty bad. Is it? Um, yeah. That's a shame, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, man. I'm sure Timothy Spall will be good, and Rachel Weisz is wearing a Tom Wilkinson. Great, great wig. Uh, yeah, but he was also in Unfinished Business. Yeah, that's very so, true. So... Yeah. Come on, Tommy Wilkes. Yeah. Um, what else have we got? Yeah, as you said, uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Because that's about as British a film as it comes, apparently. Oh, yeah. this is interesting. I Don't Blake is up for Outstanding British Film as well, so it's up for... Two. Oh, it can't win them both. That'd be insane. Um, that's just so they can give it... An act. They can make sure it has a best film award. That's, that's yeah. What it is, they'll yeah. believe in with each other. Yeah. Not, at least one. Uh, notes on Blindness is up for Outstanding British Film. Uh, not bothered. But not Mark Mode bothered. Is. Um, Under the Shadow. That's quite interesting. I like that. Right? I like that yeah. very much. Yeah. And finally, American Honey. What the f**k? Really? Oh, we've known people that just were just not fans of Andrew. Hunt. I mean, you saw it, didn't you? Yeah. 
And you, you disliked it as much as I did. You were I've, bored as I've I was. I've disliked the last two films she's put out. Oh, my God. That and Wuthering Heights. I've just... Uh, well... I think there was one before, wasn't it? Wuthering Heights. <laughs> Pass. Yeah. I don't know. I, I get Wuthering Heights and uh, Jane Eyre confused. So, oh, to, uh, no. Far from the Madding crowd confused. So. I enjoy that, though. Was it Matthias Schoenartz who has the brother? Was. was it Matthias Schoenartz who has the metal brother? Oh, it might be. Is it? Oh my god! Uh, please tell me it Let's is. look it up. Please let's look, look it up. You, you look it up then. Um. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll just do a couple more from the Baptists. Um, uh, leading actor, this is interesting as well. Go on, then. Uh, Andrew Garfield for Hacksaw Ridge. For Hacksaw Ridge. Yeah. I hear very good things about him in Hacksaw Ridge. As do I. My friend Alex, he saw it when he was over in Dubai. Yes, that, that was our in yeah. uh, Casey Affleck, obviously. This is interesting. Jake Gyllenhaal for Nocturnal Animals. Uh, do you know what? It's nice to see that film get something from somewhere because it seems to have been gone under the radar. Yeah, bit. it is. But here's the thing: Nocturnal Animals, mm-hmm. nine nominations of the Baftas. Wow, which is just what? Like, it's not really got any nominations anywhere else other than the mm. Globes and like. I don't really see it getting yeah. big Oscar it's, recognition. It's not, it's not got any SAGs or anything. No. It's just, yeah. Um, and the rest of Viggo Mortensen for Captain Fantastic, but it's good. Mm-hmm. And uh, your boy uh, Baby Goose, Ryan Gosling. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, leading actress, I'll just finish off with these. Okay. Uh, we've got Emily Blunt for Girl on the Train, which I've seen now. Have you seen now? Yeah, she's good in it. She's good, isn't she? Yeah. The rest of the film is not. <laughs> uh, Amy Adams. Glad we agree. Uh, Emma Stone, Natalie Portman for Jackie, and Mel Street, because... Yeah, Meryl, yeah. yeah. She's so overrated. <laughs> she's so overrated. Yeah. You just have to give her awards. Yeah, did she, Alan Taylor Johnson won uh, Best Sporting of the Golden Globes for yeah, Nocturnal Animals. Nocturnal Animals. Yeah. I can believe that because it was a very terrifying performance. Although, it should have been Michael Shannon that got a Best Sporting for that film. It should have been. Michael Shannon is amazing in that film. Nobody was lobbying for Alan Taylor Johnson to win that, so God knows why he's won. Yeah. Uh, maybe I think if they put him in a good mood, he'll go home, he'll distract his wife, and she'll stop making films. Maybe that's it. See, I like Noah Boy, and then I think everyone knows my feelings on Fifty Shades. Fifty Shades, yeah. <laughs> I, I share that with a lot of people. So. I'm dreading that sequel. I really am. Yeah. Ugh. Hasn't isn't the director? What's his name? He did uh, did a bunch of like adult saucy fillers in the nineties. Are you are you thinking what's his of name? Uh, uh, what's his name? Did the Red Shoe Diaries? Zalman King. I think so. Because uh, he's dead. Nope, it's not him. I was about to say because <laughs> Zalman King is one of my lifelong heroes. What is his Zolman name? King. That that man knew softcore porn. James Foley. James Foley. And James Foley did, as soon as this loads, uh, Glen Gary Glen Ross, which is a great film. <laughs> Not the saucy thriller, though. What's, what's the one? What I don't know. It? If you believe Zach and Mira make a porno, there is a saucy thriller. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at close range. None of these are porn, Case. I didn't... S- when did I ever say porn? You said saucy. That, that's like you can be saucy and not be porn. That's or a white man code porn. for porn. Come on. <laughs> uh, mm. Let's let's move on because <laughs> you're you're offending me. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna fight me. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> no, um, that was he. Uh, no, it was Almond King did the Red Shoe Diaries. Big fan. But uh, yeah, that uh, helps with my love of David Duchovny. But uh, yeah. <laughs> No, Nocturnal Animals, I, I don't think that's going to really turn up at the Oscars, that film. So, we, we didn't get to do the KGs this year. Mm. Um, the uh, second annual KGs. The second annual KGs. So, we did devise some categories. We don't get to award them, you know, academically. So, we can we can discuss them, I think. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I love a good debate. I mean, I'm just going through our, our message feed and things about a movie called Rock Dog. So, <laughs> <laughs> which just looks terrible. <laughs> Who is voice? It's, it's Luke Wilson, isn't is it? Is it Luke Wilson? It's, Luke Wilson is voicing Rock Dog, and uh, it's not Sam Shepard. It's the other one where I was getting confused with uh, the guy that's in the ranch. Oh, I know he mean. Uh, he's another Sam, isn't he? Yeah, Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott. He's yeah, voicing yeah. a yak who is called Fleetwood Yak. Oh my <laughs> god! I just know it's it's uh, like a poster that has the line "Mother Fudger" on it. Yep. And you're like, seriously? Mm. Really? We're doing this? Yep. By the way, um, something you're going to love. I was stood in the, uh, waiting for Live By Night to start the other day. I was in the lobby at Warner Bros. And they got four massive uh, UHD TVs or whatever mounted up to make one big screen in the lobby. And they just play trailers on it on a loop. Cool. And uh, they played the trailer for Roadies. Really? Yeah. Oh. And to my amazement, nobody knew what it was. So... Go figure on that one. I think that show just wasn't... It just didn't have a chance, did if it? If you've not seen Roadies, check it out. It was really good. Yeah. It was really good. Luke Wilson's never been better in it. In a way, um, I'm 
I'm sad that it ended, but I think it was a good contained, it was a good point. Point to contained end, one suppose. season. It's, yeah, it's got Luke Wilson being great in it. It's got Imogen Poots being surprisingly being impressive. Being straight up adorable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah she's amazing. R- Rafe Spall being pretty cool in it. Yeah, yeah, I liked him in it. Kind of yeah. lovable. And Carla Gugino being just a sexual goddess in it, because <laughs> she's Carla Gugino. So, um, right, let's go through our categories for uh, for the KGs yeah. this year. Then. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to start with best hairstyle? I'll go for best hairstyle, yeah. Okay. Who, who have you got? I've got... Forrest Whitaker for Rogue One. Oh, so great. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Not um, when he's younger, but when he's got the moss afro. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go for Jonah Hill in War Dogs. Ooh. No, I don't think it's as out there. It's pretty out there. Uh, well, it's like yeah. A slit, yeah. Actually, yeah. Do you know what? There you go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Jonah Hill for War Dogs. Yep. We'll give it that. Right. Best action scene. What Airport scene, Civil War. Yeah, yeah I got that yep. too. Airport scene, Civil War. Best cage in a Nick Cage movie. <laughs> this, is, this is the biggie. This is the, this biggie. Is the biggie. This is the biggie. Yeah. Do you want to save that for the end? We'll save that for the end. Save that for the end. Yeah. For the end. Okay. Because there's been so many cage films. Yeah, yeah, they have. Yeah. So let's go with the most overrated film of this year. Ooh. Ooh. What do you think? Oh, I don't know. Because I've got one very obvious contender from about three months ago. And uh, is it your name? It is your name. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've not seen it, so I feel like I can't comment on it's that. It's disjointed. It's overlong. It's not quite as revolutionary as anyone thinks it is, and yet it had at least three big name critics fawning all over it, and I could not, for the life of me, figure out why. Yeah. But and I saw this with an anime fan. That's the matter. Really um. Get get back to me on the overrated films. I'll have a I'll have a quick think. Okay. It. Most underrated. Get back to me on that as well. Okay, <laughs> fine, fine, fine. We're doing really well with this, guys. Right, do you want to do best actor? I've just got an underrated. I'll say nice guys for underrated. Really? Okay. Yes. That's, that's, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to say underrated pop star never stop, never stopping. Oh, of course you're going to say that. Because underrated, because nobody saw it. <laughs> Literally, it didn't even make the box office top ten. It was this year's her. That's why I'm saying nice guys. Because hardly anybody saw that. I don't know. At least that made the top ten. Do you say it's this year's her? Yeah, her did not make the box office top ten. Did you not know that? Still won an Oscar. Her opened. <laughs> Still on... won an Oscar. It's fine. No, no, no. Sh- her opened on Valentine's Day and didn't even I make hear the you, box but I'm, I'm top choosing 10. also not to hear you because that upsets me. That this country <laughs> didn't go see Joaquin Phoenix playing, this... playing me in a film. I know, I know, yeah. and it's an amazing movie as well. I mean, uh, underrated. Just... Uh, Midnight Special. I shall yeah, say that. I don't know. It got some I'll praise. It got a lot of praise. But... <sighs> I'm sticking with my guns on Popstar, man. Fine. It's no, so fine. underrated. We don't have to agree all the time. <laughs> that's fine. Okay, uh, have you gotten overrated yet? Not yet. Not thought of anything that you think was overrated? I'll, I'll, I'll think of something. Okay, so, right, best actor then. Who have you got for best actor? Well, for best actor, I've got Michael Keaton for Spotlight. Oh, really? Yeah, I really love that performance. Even though Did Ruffalo, you really? Ruffalo yeah. got the big scene, but I felt like he, he kind of played it accordingly. I think Michael Keaton, so understated, so perfect. See, I don't, I don't just want to say Leo. You can, you but can I say th- Leo. But I think I will. <laughs> okay, if you want to go yeah. with Leo, I will actually agree with you. If you want to take Leo, I will agree with you. I'll, I'll say Leo just because I think I think we all needed it. Yeah, we kind of did. And it was such a good performance. Yeah. Also, yeah, it's definitely. nice. It's nice to see a devout vegetarian forced to eat meat. But <laughs> <laughs> that was the point where the, the academy was like, "Well, you know what? <laughs> if you're willing to make that kind of a sacrifice, eating a raw bison liver. Yep, it's fair enough. Uh, best actress, who you got? Brie Larson. Brie Larson, room. Yes, exactly what I have as well. Brie <laughs> Larson for room, without question. Right, best supporting actor. Who did I say? Well, I thought, and I, I've got the same, it's uh, John Goodman for 10 Cloverfield Lane. Yes, and it still is. Okay, I there we are. Then. I remember. Right, Best Supporting Actress, because I think I sent this to you and, and might have surprised you. I don't know, who did you get? I've got Anjuri Rice for The Nice Guys. Nice Guys, yeah. yeah the, the daughter of The yeah, Nice Guys. Yeah, she was excellent. Yeah, she was really she good. Was really, really good. In that way that you can only be in a Shane Black movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you'd seen her in any other film, you kind of would, wouldn't have really well, made that she is the prerequisite kid. Yeah. Yeah. There's always a kid. He always loves a witty, wise beyond their years child, and exactly. she played it terrifically. She was really, really good. Best director. I'll, I'll think of some. Okay, best director. I've got Denis Villeneuve for a rival. Oh, I'll agree, actually. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, I thought yeah. you might on that yeah. one. Uh, right. Anything on Best Cage and Nick Cage movie, then? Uh, Snowden. You think Snowden? Yeah. Best, that's your best Cage in a Cage movie? Movie. Right, when we say best cage, yeah. are we saying good performance? Or we're saying... You invented this category. You literally invented this category. Yeah, well, this, this is a team effort, this show. <laughs> or are we saying best best cage? Best cage. Best cage. Yeah, we want, we want cage. You know, we, 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 want, we want full blown. We want, want the rage cage. I don't think we've... Oh, no, actually, I'm with one. 
Oh, yeah, that's exactly yes. what I have. There you go. I'm one. <laughs> you mean, I'm one. <laughs> I'll tell you, you watched it in the end. Uh, yes, I did. Why does he shout everything in that movie? I don't think he knows how a microphone works. Well, it's I, weird because... He doesn't know how like a boom mic works. At the end of the movie, they show you the real guy. And the yes, real yeah, guy yeah. speaks normally. Why is Nicolas Cage <laughs> shouting? I mean, it, it doesn't it, make sense. It's a, it's a choice. It's a choice, isn't it? <laughs> it's a creative choice. <laughs> yeah. But uh, It was a reach. He, he went for it. Oh, man. Oh. Right. Um, just speaking of, of Cage, we've got six Nicolas Cage films to look forward to this year. <laughs> really? Please go through them for me. Tell me what we've got. Okay. Come. So um, I'll, I'll have a quick look at the uh, synopses as well. Oh, we, we've already seen more well, seen like the trailer for this. So this is uh, it's known as Southern Fury in some places yeah. or Arsenal. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, a Southern mobster attempts to uh, rescue his kidnapped brother. Isn't this the one with. We watched the trailer, didn't we? This yeah. is Nicolas Cage and the e Sig, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. He's got like a fake mustache and yeah. oh, just it's just like a really bad Pablo great. Escobar costume. <laughs> um, another film called The Humanity Bureau. <laughs> oh, I did hear about that. Yeah, that's right. a sci-fi one. Yeah, in a dystopian future where the American government has enacted a secret operation to cremate those deemed expendable, an agent goes rogue and attempts to escape to Canada along with a woman and her young son. So basically. That's what's going to happen to everyone this year. That's Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Everyone escaped Canada. Um, next one, Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad? Mom and Dad. Uh, a teenage girl and her little brother must survive a wild 24 hours chewing which A mass hysteria of unknown origins causes parents to turn violently on their own kids. Oh my God, Nicholas Cage is going to go nuts at children. And I've just seen who is directing that. Who's directing it? Brian Taylor. What? Of crank fame. Wow. As in Neville Dean Taylor? Yeah, because oh they're, they're solos now. Are they solos they're now? They're solo, they're yeah. Realize. Still as mental as, as usual. <sighs> We're never getting that crank three with Idris Elba, are we? No, sadly not. They, then, they, they claimed that was what they were going to do. And then the other ones, uh, Looking Glass, uh, Inconceivable, and Vengeance, A Love Story. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that an adaptation of a, a, a Japanese film? Is it a Japanese film? I was like, I'm sure it is. Not The Vengeance. Trilogy. Vengeance, A Love Story. I think it is, isn't it? Oh, man. Well, it wouldn't be the first time, would he? He did That's bloody That's Bangkok Dangerous, didn't That's he? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? That L- was on... Lest was, we forget. I was in bed one night. That was on TV. I tried watching it again. I saw that at the cinema. I, I, as did I paid, you pay? I paid as a... Well, as an unlimited card, but still. <laughs> you know, I went... I took my own free time. I went and tried to watch Bangkok Dangerous, and... I mean, I, I saw the poster, and... Yeah. It's not the one where he's holding Close a it. gun, but there's no gun. Yeah, and also his left... His left, his left arm is like sort of around his body and yeah. then he gets lost in his jacket. Yeah, but I'll never get over that. He's actually gripping a gun well, there's no and gun. there's no gun there. Oh, it's great. It's so weird. But you know what? He remade The Wicker Man, so I don't think any of us can really claim it, claim a, a new level of insanity for no. Nicolas Cage. But uh, yeah. it's going to be an interesting year for the cage anyway. It they, is. As they always are. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, sadly, talking about we got you know wrap up last year though. Yeah, so we got we got to look at some of the uh, some of the names that have left us this past year. Oh god, yeah, it's it's been a sad year. So let's go through them in order because Wikipedia is a wonderful thing. <laughs> it's a wonderful morbid thing. And we start, of course, with the biggie, which was David Bowie. And wow, yeah. no one, no one, no one really was prepared for that one. Uh, Alan Rickman. Was that? That was yeah, that was on, that was four days. Four later. days later, yeah, both sixty nine as well. It's true, Glenn Frey. Remember that? Yeah, from the Eagles. Yep. That was, I tell you, wow. Uh, it's, to... it's crazy, isn't it? It is. I yeah. just can't believe. Gl- I mean, wow. You know. Yeah. Um, Carry on. No, except I'm, going, I'm, I'm going through the list here. Oh, Tony Burton. Yeah. Yes, Tony Burton. That was that one hit us because we're such Rocky fans. Yeah, it's Duke. I know. No <laughs> pain. No pain, man. No pain. I know. And the part that really annoyed me is he died after they'd finished filming Creed. So no. how bad do you think they felt that he wasn't in Creed, that he didn't, didn't get to appear him. in Creed? That's terrible. Tony Warren died, the writer. Mm. That was uh, that was a strange Nancy Reagan died this year. This last year. Was that just last year? That was just, just last year. Nancy Reagan died. And uh, let's see who else is on this list. Larry Drake. Dr. Giggles. Dr. Giggles. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember for Dr. Giggles yeah. as well? <laughs> God, that movie messed with me as a child. Gary Shandling. Yeah, that was a that was a biggie. Yeah. Ronnie Corbett. Last year. That was that was not so much of a biggie because he was a short man. 
<laughs> that's horrible. That was yeah. I feel bad about that. <laughs> but really uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, oh, Guy Hamilton. Very sad though. Director Guy Hamilton mm-hmm. did a bunch of the Bond movies. He died last year as well. But it's yeah, what a uh, Burt Quark. This list is really depressing. Yeah. <laughs> Anton Yelchin. That's where you get. Yeah, the, right. You, so I remember when that happened, and you text me just saying it was, was it. It was Anton Yelchin. What the f-? like in in capital letters. <laughs> yes. Because, yeah, because it was, was like, so what? shocking. It was. It re- like I thought that he'd signed up for some franchise or something, and you were just like, "What are you doing? blown away?" Yeah, yeah. Uh, Robin Hardy died Same. last year as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael Camino. Yeah, that was. Yeah, yeah that man. one. Really, he's literally never going to get to redeem Heaven's Gate now, is he? No, but uh, they're still paying for Heaven's Gate. As <laughs> they're well. still paying for Heaven's Gate. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, Gary Marshall. That was last year. Yeah, that was that was huge. David Huddleston. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, here's one that will intrigue you, because we both remember where we were when news of this man's death came out. Kenny Baker. Where were we? You were at the altar at the time. Oh, you were, that was, you were I literally remember. saying your vows as when my, that came through. Yeah, my yeah. watch went off and told me Kenny, Kenny I do Baker remember died, that because as you were saying <laughs> I do. Because a lot of people were coming up to me and said, oh, congratulations, congratulations. And you were like... Did you ever... R2's oh, just died. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Uh, oh. Gene Wilder, same month. Huge. Huge. Yeah, that huge one. Loss. That, that messed me up. That, that messed everyone up. Oh, that's, man. That's a piece of people's childhood. Right? That really is. I mean, no, we, don't we'll, we'll, we all grew we'll, up we'll on Bowie, that, for yeah. instance, but I mean, like, just Gene Wilder was just this otherworldly figure. He was like a god to kids, you know, because of that one role. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was that was one that kind of knocked me out. But when when Prince died, that was one that yeah, took like Prince the wind hasn't out appeared of me. on this list strangely. I don't know why, but even in death, is still a bit of a mystery. <laughs> he still is. Yeah. Uh, no, so- that that completely knocked me out. Uh, Alexis Arquette, mm-hmm. which for any wedding yeah. singer fans out yeah, there, yeah, George, just, yeah, destroying. Yeah. Uh, Curtis Hansen. Oh, man. I forgot about Curtis Hansen. I know. Uh, director of uh, The River Wild, uh, mm-hmm. LA Confidential. Uh, Oscar-winning director of... Uh... Yeah, he uh, he won for uh, Best Screenplay, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Robert Vaughn, because we're into November now, so yeah. Robert Vaughn Mad died. Uncle, yeah. That one, that one, because I'm such a Hustle fan. Um, oh, of course, yeah. Uh, um, uh, the Magnificent Seven. Yes. Well, yeah. Yeah. He was the last surviving member of the Magnificent he Seven. Was, yeah. He was. Which, oh, it just makes just a little even sadder sting I mean, in the that, tail, that list in your hand, there, that's just going to get sadder and sadder. You, oh, it, it you, really you, is. You are aware. Andrew Sachs, Florence yeah, Henderson, yeah. Ron Glass. Oh, man. When, oh. Oh, when Ron Glass died. I know. Big giant head from Teen Angel. Yeah. Uh, and then we had, uh, and then we had uh, Alan Thick, Jar Jar Gabor. Yeah, it's just Jar Jar Gabor's son also died that same week. Did, did you? All mm. oh, right. Uh, did he? Sorry. Yeah. It's bizarre. Uh, and then of course we end with the two worst days for one family. When on the twenty seventh, after having had a heart attack on a plane on her way back from London, mm. Carrie Fisher died. Yeah, and that was just that. Do you know that that seemed like so 2016, didn't it? That's just just the fact that everyone thought that she was maybe not getting better, but at least well, stable. Thing, she'd had a heart attack, and then she was reported as being stable, and she made yeah. sure everyone knew about it. She tried to like calm everyone. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Don't worry about Todd, me. Todd Fisher had said, yeah, yeah, said something, and and then and then she died, and then the following day, Debbie Reynolds, her mum died. Yeah, who and that's, that's... who just who just said to to her her son, Kai, mm. Carrie's brother, like she just didn't want to go on with Carrie wasn't there. That's terrible. And she just died. That's, that's just just heartbreaking. It's isn't bizarre, it? and yeah, you've you've got, you've literally got Princess Leia behind you. You've got a cardboard <laughs> cutout. It was of an enormous Leia. cardboard cutout yeah. of Princess Leia in the gold bikini, stood behind me as right we speak, but, um, which I won at one of your film quizzes. Years <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> and you sent me a picture of uh, Princess Leia riding shotgun in your car. Yes, yes, yeah. I had to I had to take her home in my convertible, <laughs> my two seater convertible, <laughs> with image. the roof down, racing to get yeah. home before it started raining. But of course, that's not even to mention some of the great other great musical artists. No, yep. because in December we lost um, uh, Vic Parfit from Oh from we Quo. did yes and then on Christmas Day oh yes of course was George Michael which that one that one took me by just completely off guard George Michael yeah. the man mo- the man known for singing Last Christmas died on Christmas, on Christmas Day. Day wow yeah I mean I've not been that shocked since James Brown died on Christmas Day yeah like that was just wow yeah. But because uh, this week obviously is the anniversary of David Bowie, so we, it's a lot today, of, isn't it? It was, it was, it was it today, today. It was today or yesterday. 
can't his bir- I don't I think his birthday was the other day and he died a few days later so that's yeah no because yeah. they were like very it, it was his birthday and he died the following, mm. following day didn't so it? I think on yeah. his birthday they put a lot of uh, tributes and everything on TV yeah and yeah that was uh, to, so well that was that was all sad um, yeah so should we make it a bit happy and talk about our worst films of last year <laughs> yeah and the fact that Miles Teller is still with us but uh, so yes the worst uh, worst films of the year list I did actually write these down do you, do you still have yours I have I'll get oh, them brilliant. up I'll okay. get them up you, so I'm glad you have managed to be able to find something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm somewhat prepared. I've got a life outside of you. <laughs> Do you really? <laughs> so I'm just yeah. trying to find out. Oh, okay. Here we are. Here we are. I think I have my list. I have yours as well, actually. Oh, great! You said oh, there me you job. go. So, so there's job. yours. Do you want right. to take yours first? I will do mine first. Okay, I'll do mine first. Your five worst films. Are these in order, or are they in no particular order? No particular. Okay, go on no then. What you got for me? No particular order. Um, right. We did have a sort of like a gentleman's agreement yeah. that we would have a Warner Brothers DC film each. Yes. yes so that was it? Yeah. I took Suicide Squad. Right. Okay. G- give us a sentence about why it's so awful. Um, well, you've seen it, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, works, that works. That works. That's my sentence. Yeah. Um, uh, Independence Day regurgitation. Yeah, which was just dreadful. That was what was. Are you even trying, Roland? Really? Nobody wants to see Judd Hirsch on a bus with kids. Nobody needs that. That, like, that was what you thought of for your sequel. Judd Hirsch yeah. and some kids on a school bus. What really? is that about? Nobody needs that. Uh, no. Um, I think you don't agree with this one, but I would defend my right to say it. Go on. Uh, bad Moms. That's fine. If it's not for you, it's not for you. That's fine. Um, I don't think it should be for anyone who ever wants to raise a fully balanced family. <laughs> okay, I'll, t- I'll, 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 I'll tell you a horrific story about that uh, after. But, uh... Okay. Uh, Zoolander 2. Partly because we should have called it Two Lander. Also partly because... It's dreadful. It is really bad. It's, it's really bad. Oh, it's terrible. It? And then finally, uh, X-Men Apocalypse. Yeah, that was pretty dire, wasn't it? X-Men Apocalypse. It was just... They built up so much goodwill. Yeah, they had they had all so much credibility to bank. Yeah, and no, um, I watched Bad what Moms and uh, over Christmas with my dear mother. Yeah, and uh, I was uh, kind of alarmed that my mother found it relatable. So <laughs> <laughs> I just like my biggest bugbear with it is that the takeaway message right at the end is at least one of your parents needs to be bad, like yeah. and and has to be like the stay at home and. Yeah. Well, you know about the Just sequel. has to be like a fun... Yeah, I do know about it. Bad so, Mums Christmas. Yeah, where you meet the Bad Mums Mums. You meet their mothers, which is going to be interesting, because who do you cast as Mila Kunis's mum? That's a good shout. Yeah. I mean, do you know what sucks? Go on. Carrie Fisher would have been perfect as Catherine Hahn's mum. Yes, she really yeah. would have. And do you know what? It would have been quite clever casting, given kind of how mouthy and filthy Carrie Fisher was. Yeah. So, would have been uh, great. Yeah. What's the, what's the quote that Carrie Fisher had in her own fictionalised... She, she wrote her own obituary. Yeah. In one of them. She said something like, strang- uh, was it, strangled to death, at, drowned in moonlight, strangled by her own bra. Strangled by her own bra. Did you hear really? about... Um, she was uh, cremated, and then she was in turn. Yes. Do you know what what her urn was? It was a Prozac pill. It was pill. a Prozac pill. Love that. An oversized Prozac pill. I didn't realise, by the way, Jolie Fisher, the actress Jolie Fisher, yeah. is her half-sister. Yes. I did not know this. Mm. Eddie Fisher. I've always had a thing for Jolie Fisher. But uh, Okay, so my worst. Right. <laughs> in no particular order. Fifty Shades of Black, <laughs> which I hated. I yeah. utterly utterly hated i didn't laugh i don't know tell i i chuckled once very briefly at the begin at in the opening reel when there was uh, a shot of of marlon wayans i forget what he was even doing mm. i think he's out jogging someone he robbed someone it was it was kind of just funny it was, it was you know right funny. but the film just did not make me laugh once it was just dire it was a satire that had no thought no heart no intelligence whatsoever uh god's not dead too of course. How did I forget that? Oh my god. Melissa Joan Hart. What the hell? Do you know what? I also, hope- they missed a trip by just calling it God's Still Not Dead. Yeah. Yeah. I, do you know what? I hope for her sake this genuinely completely paid off Melissa Joan Hart's mortgage. <laughs> because that's the only. I don't know. She's got those uh, syndicated Melissa and Joey episodes. <laughs> She's still picking up those Sabrina checks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marty Moore's like, where's my money? <laughs> exactly, yeah. But, uh... <laughs> so yeah, God's Not Dead 2. Awful, awful. And made even worse by the fact that it ends with a post-credits button that sets up a third film. Which is coming. Which is then made even worse by the fact that the 
bloody producer of it who happens to be the founder of that weird Christian movie company, Pure yeah. Flix, something called Pure yep. Flix, um, favorited and retweeted my review of it, which called it one of the worst films of the century, proving <sighs> that God's not only dead, he has no sense of irony well, or humor. Well, there's no such thing as bad press. No, there really but isn't. But there is such thing as a pretty bad film. Yeah, which brings us nicely to Mother's Day. Yeah. <laughs> which is just... Oh, right. You know what saddens me more than anything? The Guy Marshall... That this, this is, is Gary Marshall's film. final film. Yeah. Like, wow. Mm. That man deserved better. Yeah, and I can tolerate, like... He really did. ...rubbish, but pretty, like, enjoyable this Guy Marshall films, like The a, Princess Diaries and this stuff. This was but, appalling. Yeah. Ah, oh, man, that's just, just deeply saddened me. Mm. Um, <laughs> collateral Beauty, <laughs> which, yes. wow. Do you know what? If you're going to make a film this cynical and nasty, at least have at least have the commitment to be cynical and nasty. Don't try and have your cake and eat it and then make it into a happy thing no. when it's not. It is a movie about horrible people. It is a movie about one character that somehow needs to involve eight of them. It is a movie that's moral core is so rotten it's basically crumbling. It is a movie that makes you genuinely wonder how Will Smith was ever a movie star, given what he's churned out this year, which incidentally includes one of your worst films. And, mm. and a movie that just makes you think, wow. Helen Mirren's a dame, and even she starred in this gumph. Which brings us, of course, to our final, final one on my list, which is Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. Um, I'll just say my last words now, and Go then um, I know that you've been looking forward to your rant. Because rant. You've, you've not been able to rant about it since March. I've not got a rant on it. All right. I'll just turn my headphones off. No, no, you, you, please, by all means, impart your final words on this one. On Batman Superman. I mean... Yeah, it, re- it really was our doomsday, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. <laughs> oh, it was. I think, you know what I think my problem is with Batman Superman more than anything? What? What's like, that? I could live with the fact that it's incoherent. I could live with the fact that it has basically no discernible storyline that it wants to commit to. I can live with the fact that it changes its character's motivations at the drop of a hat. I can live with the fact that Superman has 46 lines of dialogue in his own film. I can live with the fact that it's not that it has to have an extended cut to try and make it even vaguely semi-coherent, even though it doesn't really add much to it, much like Suicide Squad. I can live with the fact that Zack Snyder apparently doesn't understand the concept of lighting. I can live with Jesse Eisenberg's weird fusion of the Joker and Lex Luthor. I could live with all of that. All of it. If it had any sense of irony, humour or self-deprecation, it has none of those. That's it. If it had just that, I could, I could accept it's it. It's got a couple of filters, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. It is a movie that answers how does the you know the world's greatest detective beat Superman? How does a powerless, wonderful detective mm. beat Superman? And his answer is grenades. <laughs> <laughs> really? And this is before you even get to Martha. Like, don't even, man. Just don't even. Hmm. I mean, just... Wow. I mean, also, I thought it was so long. Went on for days. Yeah, a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Grandma's PhD. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, to be honest, the fact that the movie at one point literally hinges on a jar of warm p- <laughs> kind of feels like yeah. everything you need to say about the DCEU so far, doesn't it? Hmm. Like, there were rumours this week that Justice League apparently is in trouble. Justice League's apparently awful. And and that's why Ben Affleck is being shaky about doing the, the directing the Batman. Do you know what? I completely believe it. Completely believe it. The thing I really love is they released the publicity shot of the five Justice League characters, minus yes. Superman, notably. Well, he's he's dead, isn't he? Well, yeah. Uh, of course he is. For now. Yeah, of course he is. He's, just, he's, going back with the, he's going back with a mullet and a black suit. We all know that. That's totally oh, please. It's yeah. totally happening. That's Me clearly going to yeah. happen. Except, you know, it's Zack Snyder's version, so it'll be gelled back along here. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a completely jet black suit. Um, but there's that shot of the five Justice League members, Batman, yep. Superman, uh, Batman, Wonder Woman, Cyborg. Flash, Cyborg, and Aquaman. And they're stepping off of the uh, the Javelin, which you know, which I'm sure in this version is only going to be called the Javelin because the only way you can make it take off is to run through the pilot with an actual physical Javelin <laughs> in slow motion. That's how you get the power. Yeah, that's how you get the power. Mm. But I love the fact that they've gone from that publicity shot before Batman, Superman, 
where it was the three of them. They've gone from looking like three goths in a candle shop, as Pat Oswalt called them, <laughs> to now looking like five bored middle-aged cosplayers. And, yeah, fine. That's how you want to play it. We'll see you in November. But uh, I'm just dreading it. I really am. I'm, I'm, I, I, can you honestly say you're looking forward to Justice League? <clears throat> I'm looking forward to Aquaman. That's <laughs> and, and I'm and not Aquaman in Justice League. Just Aquaman as a standalone. You, and that's that's more because I like James Wan. Have you heard the rumor, by the way, that Vin Diesel is up for Black Mantra? Black Manta. How can he? No, that's n- no. Uh, this, is, this is a rumor I heard. How can he work for Marvel and DC at the same time? No, I don't know. It's like being a Republican and a Democrat. <laughs> I'm better getting into office. Yeah, it's true. Actually, yeah. let, let's be honest. In this, in that particular yeah. equation, Marvel would be the Democrat, surely. Well, yeah, of yeah, course, of course, course. It's gotta be, gotta be. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, but uh, actually, because DC use a conservative amount of thought. Funnily enough, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has a Republican president. So, mm. uh, President Ellis, as far as I know, he's a Republican. Hence the uh, Secretary of State being General Ross. Yes. Yeah. Of course, he's, he's definitely... Well, of course he is, yeah. yeah. Oh, we never got to discuss that news, by the way. Apparently... Uh, Let's wrap it with this, yeah. Yeah. Liv Tyler. Yeah. Well. She'll be uh, returning to the MCU, which is crazy, really. Well, it's only a room. It's not confirmed. It's, it's not confirmed. It's come from the Daily Record in Scotland. You know the newspaper, the Daily yeah. Record? Because Avengers Infinity War is going to film in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Mm. So they ran an article and said, oh, and these stars are going to be here. Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans. And they ran through the full list. And they, in the right. middle of it was Liv Tyler. Liv Tyler. And it was the first anyone had heard of this. That's mad. So that, that ties it even more into Incredible Hulk. Because obviously, yeah. Jenna Ross. Well, because, Senator Ross. Well, yeah. let's be honest. Until last year, I think they tried to make us forget about Incredible Hulk. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a surprise when you saw William Hurt there, wasn't it? Well, they had to come up with an explanation as to why we hadn't seen him in years. Oh, he had a heart had attack. Had a heart attack, yeah. <laughs> on the golf course. Yeah, had a heart attack on the golf course. Really? Because that character never seemed like he would play golf. <laughs> but uh, have you ever seen certainly there's a marvel one shot that follows up explains the end of incredible hulk which one is that there is uh, i forget what it's called oh it's the consultant it's the very first I marvel I've seen one that shot one, yeah. in which they explain that he punched tony stark and yeah. tony stark in retaliation bought the bar and had it demolished yeah fantastic because <laughs> i can absolutely believe that as can i yeah but uh, so from one veering sweat of bad behavior to another here it is your moments of cage you are me! Do you want me?